Hey everybody, how's it going? Welcome to The Secret History, living in your aquarium. Oh boy, we've got lots of people chatting before this thing actually even took off off the ground. It is, I thought, Washington, and uh, apparently I was wrong. Apparently, uh, and if you've seen me on streams lately, this is in the daylight where everybody sees me standing with the light going off and on, uh, the floodlight, because my wife has been working really early, so... I've been out here um, <laughs> at night hanging out, but how's everybody doing? Let me get into the into the shade. Let me throw some shade on on me. There we go. Whoa, shaky, 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 bakey. Let's try to let's turn this around. Let's turn around. So today, of course, as always, I will be doing a live stream uh, on a Tuesday, and I will be. We'll be discussing, let's see, look at, look at the beautiful blue sky and the sun. Man, we got pumpkins out and blue sky. Pretty cool in our little duplex. Th this is our yard, by the way. So when whenever I think about us getting a place finally so I can actually have some more overstock tanks other than the one we're going to talk about today, uh, this porch and the one upstairs, and then this is a share. I mean, this is a shared porch for two places, but then this is a shared driveway for another two places. And so we got this car spot. So everything that I've done when you see me doing stuff outside, see, I've drained the tanks now. And um, so we've got one, two, three, four, five tanks all uh, now out of commission, other than the one against the wall. This one over here is. Uh, well, let's let's just while I go through the chat real quick. I know this is exciting. While we wait for some people to make their way in, let's see if any of the fish that are still in here come to the top. We've got rainbow shiners in here, and we've got um, what else do we have in here right now? We've got some uh, guppies, and then also some white cloud minnows. So I'm just kind of curious to see if they swim by. I know it looks dark, but you'll see their bright yellow white when they come by. So let's let's just chill here for a sec while I say hello to everyone, see what's going on. And then we're going to talk about overloading your tank. Usually live streams obviously we kind of get going, we get cranking right at that kind of like 10 minute mark is where the meat and potatoes start to get served. Right now you're just having yourself a little uh, a little sip of champagne uh, waiting for dinner. Or maybe champagne doesn't come before dinner, so maybe you're having uh, 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 some water with lemon in it. That, that's about how exciting this is, water with lemon. Maybe without lemon. But what's going on, Pat Jess? What's going on, T-Bone Mary? So good to see everyone. Mm. Let's see here. We've also got Muppet. What's up? We've got Ridgel. Hello. Uh, we have got, of course, uh, I, said, I think I said T-Bone, uh, your average fish keeper, uh, Yoke says, says my tank is way overstocked. Um, yeah, that, that, that cichlid that you guys saw in the, on the cover shot, I was at, uh, PetSmart last night, and they had those for three ninety nine each as adults, and they were beautiful. Um, I don't really like buying fish from Pet, PetSmart or Petco, but... Super, super pretty fish, and I, I don't think I've seen any that colorful. Also, in other news, <laughs> my neighbor is smoking us some chicken, uh, some, some, I don't know, apple wood or something, on his smoker, because I, uh, I took care, well, I didn't really do anything. I just, you know, mail kind of stuff while they were gone. But that's exciting. <laughs> so, 6 o'clock. I'm out of here. Not that it'll go that. Not that we'll go that long today, folks. But yes, hello, Greg. Let's see here. Water Flora, hello. Peplin Creek, hello. Good day. Fish and Flora. There's two links up. A couple people are waiting on the other one. Oh, you know what? I wondered if that was going to happen because. I launched the, like, I'm going to stream later link earlier today on my laptop, and then I couldn't find it when I, like, it won't show up on my mobile device. So I think 
that link uh, just I don't know what happened I, if it just doesn't exist on both mobile and laptop but I hope people find their way here uh, I don't know maybe someone could be kind enough if that other stream is just waiting and like loading or something uh, if they could hop over there and say uh, this is a false alarm don't go there Jason what's up buddy I just saw your call from this morning I slept in the day today as I do frequently um, let's see here just gotta get I gotta get down to the bottom before we can even start that usually takes 10 minutes anyways all right let's see here also what was I gonna show you guys I think I was gonna show you mmm so I have this rock reef and on this rockery, we get lots of moss growing, and um, it's wet pretty much 24-7 this time of year. So we start to get these massive growths of moth, moss, and uh, I've, I've successfully kept it under water, but it just never seems to be doing super well. But I think I'll make another attempt at it uh, again this year, uh, and usually... I have a couple other little plants that I've accidentally started growing in the potted plants on my deck. But since we went on a mushroom hunt the other day together, uh, there's a mushroom that popped up in a potted plant. Um, so that was kind of always fun to find little critters places. But in any case, let me flip this back around. Okay, so overstocked fish tanks is there any news we need to take care of any burning issues is anybody's guppy dying right now do we need to do some cpr group cpr is that a thing spirulina what's going on john mckenzie uh atkins nature's aquarium what is up um snowing in wisconsin yeah Traeger and a Subaru. Yeah, my actually it's a it's a oh well yeah there is a Subaru. There's also a Toyota 4Runner. Um and then mm, Oh yeah, it's done doing its its crazy smoking dance. But um yeah, I've got my pickup and then my wife, the car is usually here, has got her Subaru and that's actually we've been taking this car up when we went into the mountains to get a uh, stone oh so jadeite so all that bluish gray stone i have um so yeah let's see here l dub what's going on the crime pays channel is amazing good call on that guy oh good i'm glad you you dig that guy yeah so i know some of the folks in our community the fish community definitely follow him already <laughs> sorry you guys aren't looking at anything beautiful right now hold on I'm just standing where there's Wi-Fi and trying to catch up on chat, and then we'll hop inside, and, uh, hold on, let's see here. Uh, hey, Lynn, how's it going? We're headed into moss season, and I love it. Yeah, for sure. Wait, what, what did I miss? Somebody doesn't like something, and, and uh, someone wants to know why. Uh, let's see here. Oh no! So uh, Sabine Gray, do you are you having an issue with the fish? Uh, sorry, that's what that's what I was reading. I got things messed up. Did somebody, Dan? Did you just call me Slex? Slex is an interesting uh, abbreviation of Alex, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Hmm. Oh, you're better. Well, what can we do for your beta? What's what are the symptoms? What maybe we have the cure here to here together? We can solve that and then go inside. I just I wanted to share this lovely day with y'all in case you're in a gloomy place. Um, let's see. Most of my tanks are overstocked, but lots of plants filtration, water changes, and keeping them stable. Ah, you're on the you're on the the right track then. Uh. Let's see here. 618 and 6. Wasn't on live chat. Sorry, that's probably why I missed it. Uh, la, 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 
la 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 Ten minutes. Let's see. I might have missed. That's that's weird. I I guess it's not gonna show up because. Uh, Uh, I guess it's not going to show up. Sorry, guys. Uh, you'll have to retype what's wrong with the beta. Um, because for me, I guess I had it on top chat rather than live chat. And so it just, it, it didn't load anything I missed. Um, Moss. Uh, yeah, I'll totally do an episode on Moss. Um, there's so many kinds. So much to say, yet so little to say. It's kind of a weird one that way. Um. Hold on, there's something on the screen here, or on the lens. Here, here, here. <clears throat> um, okay. The, he's grasp, uh, the, the beta is gasping and hiding and only comes for air. Had a pneumonia spike. Oh, well, so with that, I would just highly recommend, I mean, even though bettas can breathe air, uh, I'd put an air stone in if you have a con if it's in a container with enough room that that's not just going to startle the heck out of it. But then what I would also do is I would uh, I would put just a, a good amount of catapa leaves in there. I'm sure you did the water change uh, and, and took care of the ammonia issue. Um, but the gasping, he's doing that because he has scar tissue or um, ulcers on his on his gills after that. What's going on, Jerry? How's it going, buddy? Um, and Jeff, of course, hello as well. Um, hello to all of you, including the lurkers. And I mean that by both the channel members who are the lurkers and the, uh, the others who are literal lurkers, both literally and figuratively. Okay. Alex, any chance talking of cold water North American species fish for a tank? You know, it's funny you said that. Because the tank I was setting up just to put the camera on while we chat about overstocked tanks. Because this is my first attempt at overstocking a cold water tank. So this is a 7 gallon. And it has a dozen rainbow shiners. Or no, actually it has 10 rainbow shiners. I just lied to you all. These are the rainbow shiners. They used to be really scaredy cats. And now they're getting bold and... They're not that afraid of me, like, on the my hand on the glass. It's not that big of a deal, which is pretty cool. Um, and the other thing is uh, I've got the Madakas in here. This water is about, right now, if I had to guess, about 65 degrees. Probably the same temperature as my house. But also the Gudgeons are in here. And uh, we also have, which don't like it really cold, but they'll take 65. See, there, there they are, the uh, Blue Daisy rice fish there's some juveniles or fry whatever you want to call them right here and then on top of that we also have six of the if they're they're really um scaredy cats but of the elisoma gilbert eye which are the sunfish from florida usually they're right here um so this tank is kind of an interesting one i bet we can coax one of the sunfish out of this moss right here if we if we agitate it with a zip tie. Yep, one just came out for a sec. Um, hold on. Oh, there we go, right there. So this is the first time I've ever had a cold water, oh, don't zoom too close, there's the Gilbert eye, little female. Um, no color, no blue color, just gray spots and clear. Uh, and then we've got, I think, at least two males in there, and I think three females. Uh, I don't expect them to spawn in here. So that's that's one thing that I want to address about overstocking a tank. And when I say overstocking for today's purposes, let's say that that means <clears throat> more than, say, an inch per gallon or even two inches per gallon. And you you guys have probably heard the old myth of, uh, you know, you should be putting about an inch per gallon of fish in your aquarium. Well, <clears throat> hold on, let me turn this around. My fish room's a mess. There we go. That's a better zoom depth. Um, so, let's talk about that real quick. And I'm sure most of you know this. Most of you guys are uh, returning 
folks who are skilled in the hobby, many of you with more years than me. But when we talk about the inch per gallon, that's really a rule for people who haven't had an aquarium before. It doesn't make any sense if you say that for a 10 gallon and you have a five inch Oscar or something. Now, on the other hand, if you have a Rasbora, that's not one inches of fish either. So there's a happy medium. And I like to kind of think of it as, you know, about the size of a guppy or like a female guppy or a molly or platy. About one inch of that size fish per gallon is what a standard filtration setup on an aquarium when they rate it in the hobby, like if it says good for 20 to 40 gallon or 20 to 30 gallons, that's kind of where they're looking at. And they assume that you aren't going to have plants, but they do assume that you're going to have, uh, in it, or not potted, but I mean plants in general, however they are. Uh, but they're going to assume that you have uh, water changes weekly, at least. So those are all inputs in the equation that we can toy with, you know, right? So if you add plants, you can add X amount more to that. And, and I've found that plants triple my holding capacity compared to a, 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 a bare bottom glass tank. And I've also found that filters, you know, um, I wish they'd almost rate them in surface area, which would be hard. It would be very hard to do because of the nooks and crannies, but they could have kind of a rough estimate for different densities of foam. Maybe there is something like that online, but I feel like that would be more useful than rating it the way they do because a lot of people are lost when you say, uh, good for 20 filter. This is a hang off the back and this is a mini canister or I don't even have a filter. So that's another thing. Like, let's look in this room. This is a tank that I would say for a 17 and a half gallon, it's stocked about where they say it should be. Maybe a little more, but there's no filtration on it other than the substrate, which is a couple inches thick now. Um, let's see here. So it's I don't know, maybe two inches thick. And the substrate is old on this one. Actually, this tank is overstocked compared to what it should be. Uh, but I really enjoy this tank too. Um, the water has gotten cloudy lately. I think it had a bacterial bloom of some sort. But the thing that's key about this, none of these plants are that fast growing and my light's not that strong. And you may think, what does a light have to do if I can overstock my tank? And the answer is a whole lot. I mean, everything from temperature to... Oh, boy. Sorry about that. If we lost it, we lost it for a second. We lost the feed for a second. That corner is kind of a dead zone. So hold up. But um, so that's another thing. The filter is another thing. Like I said, like here's a little corner filter versus a sponge filter. Both of these are air driven. Um you know, and then versus kind of your typical sponge filter you may be used to, this is very similar, this kind here, to this kind here. They're really the same, just different orientations. And then light, like I said. And then the other major, major important thing when talking about overstocking a tank, and I'll kind of dissect some of this stuff too, is your flora on top of the water, or your flora that is fast growing. Because you can have Anubius all day long and it is not going to keep up with most of the ammonia, nitrites, nitrate in your tanks. It just does not. Same with moss. It is it is gonna grow, it's gonna take some nutrients and this moss in this tank grows as fast as moss can. If you guys have been watching the last few weeks, you know how much is growing in here. Um, but you are limited by slow plants. And in this tank here, honestly, I have quite a few slow plants. And so what do I have going so that I can have, right now I've got about, for a 20 gallon long, I've got probably triple the fish load I should have in here. I probably have 15 guppies in here, um, six uh, of the Somfongzi rasboras, a dozen of these gobies, or well, just under, I guess 11 of them. Uh, probably 40 red cherry shrimp at least. Yeah, actually, probably way more than that. Uh, and then we've got 
11 pseudomagills also. What's with 11 today? And then also the snails that are in here. And we have probably, oh, I don't know, seven or eight Madaka rice fish. And <laughs> on top of all that, we have a few baby plecos that hang out in here and do their little darn thing. They do the darn thing. So um, one way I'm getting away with it is that I have substrate that's active. So I have uh, Amazonia and Fluval stratum mixed together. And then below that and beside that, I also have sand beds that have the, um, the no oxygen zone or anaerobic uh, areas in them so that as things decay and fall to the bottom of the tank and you end up with uh, you know, leaves like these with holes in them and moss and just you know, things broken off and falling down, old snail shells, all that kind of stuff. It will actually work its way down through the cap. Now, this this uh, this grade of stuff doesn't make the best cap because you need an inch or two of it to actually add up to a cap. But when you use sand like this, even a quarter inch, which won't stay a quarter inch evenly distributed, so that's why you want to do an inch or half inch at least, um, this is, you can see, the anaerobic bacteria actually can start as soon as, you know, right on the edge of air. So dense sand can be your friend when you're capping things off. When the roots go below that sand, they bring in oxygen. But people think anaerobic bacteria is a bad thing lately, I, I've noticed. And it's not. It's, it can create sulfur, yes. But if you have a tank like this one that has no way to create its own um, filtration cycle with the substrate, that really limits your holding capacity. But let me, I mean, let me also address the point that carry almost no bio load on your tank. So you really don't need to worry too much about shrimp. Right now I need to do water changes and I'm still not supposed to be lifting 50 pounds or whatever. So um, I'll have to wait and either do a bunch of little changes or get my wife to help me. But this sponge filter is going to be my safety stop, my my way of cheating the system. So in this tank, this is my, my cheat right here, is this sponge filter. And a sponge filter this size will actually take care of up to a 20 long, no problem. There is a lot of there is a lot of surface area in that, um, in the nooks and crannies on that, and also in the mulm that gets stuck in there. Now, oxygenating the water, which it also does, is another way that you can get away with more fish because a lot of fish need that oxygen. Now, the hotter the water, the harder it is for them to get oxygen. And that's not true for every fish. I mean, bettas and um, all the labyrinth fish, licorice gouramis, things like that they don't need to worry about that piece of the puzzle because they'll go, regardless of that, they'll go to the top and gasp for air if they have don't have good dissolved oxygen. However, other fish like, if we come down here, you may wonder, I have a 10 gallon down here and I have eight pandaloches, yet I have a giant sponge filter a substrate that does have below it an anaerobic line. I actually moved it and flattened out the substrate the other day. Uh, and it does have uh, two extra air stones in it and plants, as well as floating plants, which are some of the fastest growing plants for sucking nitrates and ammonia out. So you may wonder, those fish are teeny. Why are you doing that? Well, one is because they, these, these guys, pandaloches, they like cool water. And they actually, um, they come from, I, I've kept them in past years around 72 to 74. I'm keeping them at 67, 66 right now, and they're doing far better. Uh, they're more active, they're more communal in their behavior with each other, and they're growing better now. They were kind of just slowly creeping along at first, and uh, so I just decided to match them exactly with the wild not in the spawning season or summer, but just the average, took the high and low temp of the area they're from and used that. Now, when I drop the temp like that, they get more oxygen, but these guys are used to rivers and streams. 
So they need tons of oxygen going. And even sometimes I run the hang off the back. It's full of water and it, it's in theory I could start it up cycling it again soon. It would probably cause a, a bloom for a moment and then it would um, it would start cycling itself back up. Because uh, there'd be a lot of dead bacteria without the oxygen running through the water. There, there's some but not quite enough. Um, so those are kind of the, the, the little the little things to think about the the inputs on the system i mean the other one is water changes right because we could have a tank with absolutely nothing going for it it could not even have filtration uh and as long as it had enough oxygen in the water so if it had a power head that churned up enough oxygen or it had um a hang off the back without any filter floss even but just agitated the water that would be enough to actually keep fish in it, but to keep a lot of fish in it, I mean, like like you see in Asian markets uh, that sell uh, fish for the aquarium, frequently they'll keep in a tank, in a 20 gallon tank, they'll keep two or 300 guppies. And the way they do it is they constantly are cycling water through that has oxygen in it. And that's how they do it. This tank has nothing on the bottom. I'm sorry for the glare. We're going to get out of here in a sec because the glare is just too bad this time of day. But I wanted to do an earlier stream because I know some of y'all this works better for. And um, the 6 or 7 p.m. streams sometimes are, you know, four hours later than this or whatever. And it just doesn't work out. But this tank here, nothing is anchored. You can see there's a lot of algae growing. That's because this light's actually too much. This light's too much for this tank yet I can still keep it overstocked because I have this big old stacked filtration here and I do water changes on it all the time. I do two or three a week most of the time. Lately it's been like one a week and the nitrites are at like 60 right now. So I definitely need to get on top of that. But there is this misnomer in our hobby that, that nitrites, nitrates, um, and ammonia, that, that you can't have any of all of them and that's true you don't want ammonia for the most part there's some fish that can tolerate it but for the most part you don't want any ammonia nitrites you don't want because they're a bad sign and yes they are toxic but generally that's not what's going to kill your fish it's rare that nitrite poisoning alone will kill your fish now nitrates the last thing in the cycle as we all know if, if we've if we know the cycle of nitrifying bacteria <clears throat> that's the one that we're okay having in our tanks and if you go online there is no hard fast rule about what the level is for nitrites or nitrates sorry um nitrates and i've <laughs> just out of neglect out of years of keeping i've let nitrates get to 200. I mean, bad, bad, Alex. You are a terrible, abusive fish father. I know, I know. Um, but I've done that, and if the fish inch towards it, and they're hardy fish, sometimes they don't care. They're just totally fine. Now, I have other fish, like those loaches, where you get over 50 or so, and they start turning gray, they start gasping, they start getting burns on their gills, just like ammonia would, and they, they do very poorly. So selecting your stock, your species, that's another thing that we're, we gotta think about. And I'm gonna tell you the last, the last component of this, uh, other than you know upkeep maintenance on the aquarium, which goes more than just water changes. I'm talking about you know scraping the algae, having Malaysian trumpet snails that overturn your substrate so you're getting the max out of it. Believe it or not, using fertilizers, which even introduces more nitrates sometimes. But all these things keep your plants growing on, say, a tank like this. Root tabs, that's another secret weapon. But with all of that, to keep the waste levels low, you need to have a deep enough substrate so that you get this anaerobic growth. Now, most people don't want this, and traditionally, we've been told... Bad, bad, it, it, it's cyanobacteria, it's always bad. Well, this cyanobacteria needs light and it dies if it sees sun. There are cyanobacterias that will grow up out in your tank. I do agree that I don't think those are good. 
I think they're bad in a sense like black beard algae and in that they just take up the biome for good bacteria, whereas I see them as just kind of indifferential space stealing bacteria. But when you see that your your substrate is anaerobic like this and that it's not fully colonized by cyanobacteria, that also tells me that this zone, you can fix all the heavy minerals like um, iron oxide, things like that. That's, this is where the plants will get it. And when their root comes into contact with it, they bring that oxygen into this layer. So you can also stop this layer if you're still of the opinion that anaerobic layers are bad. I mean, if you look in a lake, you see bubbles coming up from the bottom. That is methane and sulfur uh, or um, hydrogen sulfide. That's um, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide and you know nitrogen gases and oxygen it's all those things coming from different bacteria different bacteria create different uh different biomes now over here same substrate here there is none of that and we talked about this last week but it's because there's this sword plant here there's also mayaka planted all back in here and its root system has actually it's hard to see on camera has actually come through here this kind of brown tangle of roots has come through here and oxygenated this whole area for it. And so it's not functioning that way, nor is back here. You can maybe see the roots back on this big uh, Cypress Hell Fairy uh, or Hell Fry, however you'd like to pronounce that. So that's, that's one little uh, thing that I feel like a lot of people overlook is that it's good to have an anaerobic layer it just needs to be capped just like if you had all gravel here you would be allowing father fish says it on his channel you'd have an open sewer all the fish poop it has to break down that can take a month can take more then the nutrients have to break down and become uh forms that are able to be metabolized by plants and so that takes time also even more sometimes years and so that's where we can cheat the system and we can use root tabs or we can use things like these. Now this, I don't like to add nitrates. So this is another secret weapon in overstocking. And that is nitrate free uh, aqua all in one. I mean, if you want to call it all in one systems, a lot of different places make it. I like uh, ADA, they're on the light end of things, so it is, and it is expensive. I have to say it's like 17 or $16 for a bottle, but you, do, you dose daily, it is absorbed daily, ideally. Um, you know, you have to kind of figure out for your plant load and do some research, but no nitrites, no nitrates, no ammonia. And a lot of fertilizers have nitrates, nitrites, and ammonia because it's the easiest thing to make plants grow. It really is. It's just not the best for your fish. That's why you don't just go out and put potting soil straight into your tank with fish before letting it cycle and letting bacteria move in to start breaking things down. Now, all that being said, after I just said that it's okay to have a anaerobic layer, I need to make it clear that you don't want just anaerobic substrate. That's why we don't want to just put just in for that level in my opinion now what you want is the best of both worlds and on all your surface area and also in your filters here's a canister filter a big old five gallon canister filter um that is going to act as my nitrifying bacteria storage what is that doing that's faking out the layer of nitrifying bacteria that's usually the first line of decomposition you can check out my former video on smells to see what the former uh, what the decomposition smells are and which gases are are emitted but just as gases are emitted that's from the bacteria breaking things down and also from um um uh, oh, what are they called analides is that is that the right word i can't remember now uh breaking down <coughs> basically um biological tissue and so you need this, this first layer that is oxygenated. And that's why, like I said, the Malaysian trumpet snails can get you more bang for your buck on your, your surface area because they're constantly overturning it 
And instead of it getting completely colonized and then matted down or too densely covered, and, and so let me explain this uh, in another way too, in that when you're trying to make surface area, whether it's a filter, a sponge filter or gravel like this, what's gonna happen, yes, there is bacteria on this, these surfaces. There's bacteria on every surface. There's not anywhere near as much as in, say, this moss probably. It's a denser, uh, safer environment for it, and same with a coarse sponge. But what happens when we start putting dead debris and um, you know leaves and all sorts of stuff like that in here, and then moss grow or uh, I should say bacteria grows over it or algae grows over it. Well, it's not this endless layer of surface area because right now we're measuring these spheres and their surface area, and even going down a several rows, that water's still moving because of the strength of this this. Uh, how much the water's moving here. So water movement is another important role. And if that gets filled in, and now we have a mat of bacteria across the top and not a thin coat of biofilm with some nitrifying bacteria over every little round piece, you've just cut your surface area immensely. I mean, five, tenfold, I don't know, how a lot. It could be more than that. So that's another thing to consider. Um, Oh, look how tightly schooled these uh, ember tetras are. Somebody must have been messing with them. I bet it was you, ma'am. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to mention. And the last thing that we're going to touch on before I hit some of these questions, because I see your questions building up, and I've been ignoring chat for 30 minutes almost now. Time gets away from me. Sorry, guys. But what I was going to say is the last thing that we can control other than food and feeding, because... You don't want excess ammonia building up from food. And also, you don't want excess plants dying and building up ammonia. You can have some that feeds your biome, <clears throat> but you can't overstock beyond what a lake, say, would be. And a lake has much more room than your aquarium per fish in the water. So what I was going to say, the last, the last little piece of the puzzle is how active are your fish, where are they, and what are their how, that, what their diets like. If you have all plecos, and they're all just hanging out on the bottom and on the glass, and you're feeding them algae and messy zucchini and all sorts of stuff like that, you're going to have uh, you know a lot of ammonia coming out in their curly Q spiral poo, which you can actually see in their bellies. It's kind of funny. Um, However, if you have midwater fish, a bunch of tetras that are moving around, mid to top water guppies, and then say you even had some hatchet fish or butterfly fish or killifish, something that's at the very top, when you utilize each layer of your tank, one, it helps move water around, two, it gives CO2 to your plants, because we already discussed, don't attempt this without either doing daily water changes, a constant loop auto water change, or a buttload of plants. Just, I don't recommend it. There's too many things that go wrong. And the thing is, a lot of these fish that I keep like the water slightly acidic. And that becomes slightly dangerous in that, one, bacteria can crash if it gets too acidic. So you don't want to keep it down in the five range. If I'm spawning anything that needs that, I take it out of here and I do it in a small tank where I'm not scared to kill beneficial bacteria for a couple days and just do water changes. Now, at the same time, if it gets too the TDS heavy, a lot of these fish don't like that. And it also builds up the pH to a alkaline level. And we don't necessarily need that. Now, some plants like alkaline, some like soft. You can orient that to your water. And I always say don't fight your local water work with it unless you have, you know, an ROD system or, you know, something like that that allows you to essentially have distilled water where you can start from scratch and kind of do what you want to do. Um, so essentially you put all those ingredients that we've talked about together between we want to run down it real quick before we get into questions and they can be unrelated or they can be related. But uh, I just want to kind of put this together so that folks watching in the future can look at it and say, all right, cool. I see that that is, uh, you know, an episode that's cohesive rather than a title that makes no sense. Uh, so we're going to say, first of all, substrate and conditioning your substrate. 
layering your substrate. If it was five inches thick, great. Um, you know, that would be all the better. You've got your nitrogen level, your turnover from substrate, both roots and biological, whether that's digging cichlids or that's uh, trumpet snails, Malaysian trumpet snails are experts at that. Whether that's earthworms or blackworms that are under there, whatever it may be, something rooting around does help. It's like tilling your soil. It's like aerating your soil for that matter. So then the next thing is going to be the anaerobic layer, which is where we can fix all those nutrients for the long haul and also trap them under a cap or under enough of the oxygenated level that they are just down there and oxygen level decreases, decreases, decreases into where they're comfortable. So that's the substrate bit of it. And we have active, which means it has um, minerals and it has ammonia. Really, when I say active, I mean it has ammonia, it has nitrites and nitrates, and it could have various other compounds too that over time, yes, they're good for plants, but they may be harsh for fish. So you want to kind of be careful about that. You want to maybe let the tanks cycle and do your water changes. You guys can look up videos that I've done plenty of times on how to do a planted tank with a, a soil substrate, a dirted tank. And dirt versus EcoComplete versus Amazonia, all those are going to be active, whereas like a Fluval or a Brightwell, that's semi-active. It has the minerals and it has a clay that can then be, it's porous and it can be colonized and it can absorb those nutrients that you're putting in the water column or root tabs, but it's not in itself the main driver other than trace minerals. But it's, I mean, it's still a step better. It's still, I think, miles better than having a substrate that is inactive, like glass beads or uh, gravel. Now, if you have gravel, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. In fact, you're gonna, we're going to get a lot of glare when we take a look over here because it's such a low-light tank. But basically, this is gravel that has four or five years now of mulm on it. And it has now become a functioning deep substrate bed. And because of that, the nitrites and nitrates are nothing in here right now. But the light is so low, and I have a lot of floating plants. So we'll, after we talked about the substrate, we talked about plants. So we're talking about fast-growing plants, because you can have all the Bucephalandra and Anubias and Java Fern and, uh, you know, what else? Uh, all the slow-growing plants in the world, and it doesn't mean much. Upon Eden, that's a bulb plant. It's using starches and sugars from the bulb down there. This whole thing, most of it's coming from the bulb, honestly. Um, it's getting some carbon out of the water, some oxygen, some nitrogen, but the sugars and things are coming out of the bulb. So it's not taking away the waste of the fish. It's not cheating you extra space in your tank. So you want plants that both draw from the substrate somewhat and that will put roots in and aerate that in spots and also keep some of those uh, anaerobic layers in other spots because both are good things. It's just, it needs to be a balance. It's a yin and yang type thing. And basically, I mean, wood's another good one. Tannins, that will keep the, the fish's slime coat and their immune system by default after that. I mean, it's so dark over here. Let's go back to the other tank. But by default, that really will help those things. So after we talk about the tannins, the substrate, the plants, the plants also are surface area for colonizing beneficial bacteria, which is terrific. So then we talked about powerheads and pumps and oxygen. And it's not so much the oxygen always. I mean, it depends on the species of fish. You have to know what you're keeping. Is it a fish like a, a sorority of bettas? One, they don't want the moving water. But two, they don't care about the oxygen that much unless they're sick, unless they're hurt. They they can go to the top and, and breathe air. Same with like snakeheads and uh, other catfish and things like that. Licorice gouramis. There's plenty of fish. Look up labyrinth fish. It's a labyrinth organ is what it is that means they can breathe air. Even uh, guppies, they go, or not guppies, sorry. Um, even uh, quarries go up and gulp air. To what extent? I don't know. They don't have a labyrinth organ. They're doing something. I don't know. They like it. Mikey likes it. And uh, so then we've got water moving. 
That's going to keep the debris and things moving towards your filter, to, towards your filtration. That's going to keep water that's oxygenated moving towards your nitrifying bacteria, which at this point, now you've got surface area. You've got a, a very non-dense sponge filter on your entire plant system. Now, granted, some plants uh, keep it away with their chemicals and things like that, with, with the, the various compounds in them. And others attract other helpful bacteria, fungi, and all sorts of things in the microbiome. So that's another piece to the puzzle. Then we talked about different kinds of fish. So you want to have some fish that maybe eat vegetation and eat uh, vegetable, spirulina, things like that, because that produces one kind of waste. The next layer maybe, and you want them in one layer, You then you want another layer of fish that helps moving things if you don't have the elements like the power head uh, or a, a hang off the back or a fountain or a spray bar or an air bar, you know, whatever. However you want to do it, these are all inputs and you can turn one down, but you'll have to turn another up is kind of the way I like to look at it. And so you look at this as kind of, you've got maybe 500 points and 1,000 points that you can go up or down. You know, maybe you've got, you've got uh, 10 different subjects that can each have 100 points from 0 to 100 on how much they're in your tank. But in the end, you can only use 500 points. So you have to allot those points in a balance or you're not going to get a good tank in the sense of overstocking it. Now, also, let's just use common sense. I didn't say it yet. But you don't want to put a freaking Oscar with a bunch of guppies or you don't want to put, um, you know, uh, tiger barbs or something like that with a bunch of baby guppies. They're just going to get eaten. It's a recipe for stress. Stress causes pheromone responses and then you get fish that are not happy and they're also not healthy. And so you can throw all the katapa in the world in a tank and if your fish are just scared to death, they're going to be miserable. Now, then we get to the other element out of them, which is the water changes and or filtration. I know those are very different things, but I like to put them in the same. And I know we talked about some filtration with the bacteria and on surfaces, but we're going to be talking specifically about whatever you choose between hang off the back or sponge or air stone even. Now, an air stone doesn't have that surface area, but it is oxygenating the water to be a nitrifying surface area wherever it may land but you need that oxygen and that that nit or and the nitrates moving over that bacteria for it to be of any use breaking it down i mean if you don't feed it it can't disassemble it so um that's you know that's just how it works and then we talked about the other part that gets overlooked so often which is lighting and choice of plants and that is you know you can put all the lilies in the world in and they're not going to take much out of the tank. They have bulbs. Rhizome plants and tuberous plants or bulb plants, yes, they do take some nutrients out of the tank, but they don't take that much. And when it comes down to it, what you want are stem plants, um, hornwort. You want plants that can break off in nature, float down the river, and then plant themselves as something else. Those are the very best. Whether And, and moss does that, but it's slow. Um, Anubius can do that, but it's slow. Java fern, slow. Bobitis, hedulata, slow. But when we look at things like Bacopa, Ludwigias, Rotalas, um, Limnophilias, uh, those kind of things, that is where we're looking at. We're getting all these nutrients. Now, there's no C CO2 for weeks in this tank, uh, months actually at this point, over a month and a half, I believe. Maybe even two now. And so you're, you're also seeing that these plants, their color and everything is totally from the nutrients of this overstock tank. I probably have uh, 25 quarries hiding in there. I have four um, leopard frog plecos. I have some baby, um, what are these here? They're the albino longfin guys, uh, the bristle nose. And then we have, I don't know where my yellow... Uh, my big boys are, but we also have two lemon and citrus in here that are full grown. We've got honey gurumis. We've got one blue powder gurumi. We've got a dozen em endlers, or uh, sorry, not endlers, uh, ember tetras. We've got about a dozen guppies now that are full grown and some babies. We've got 10 uh, of these um, pencil fish 
And then we've got about eight jelly bean tetras, these guys right here. Um, and we have shrimp in here. Where are they? There's one right there. There's a red cherry shrimp there. We also have Malawa shrimp in here. Um, and then we have cribs in here. And we have a uh, uh, reticulated Siamese algae eater that swam by. And we have Cochus tetras uh, in here. So it may, at, from a glance, not look overcrowded because they're smaller bodied fish in a 42 or whatever gallon tank it ends up being, uh, plus the sump or the, the canister filter. And we're going to say sump is just a big canister filter or an extension of your tank. And all those elements still apply in a sump. That's why you need a light in your sump if you're going to put plants in there for excess filtration. Oh, and I forgot, I've got nanochromus fish in here too, right there. And snails, and then we've got the Malawa shrimp all chilling up on the moss up here. Um, so it's a full house, that's to say the least. But those are the main things you're going to want to look at and the water change. Like I said, if, if you have the, the machinery, the money, and feel like burning through water, you could just put new water in here that splashes and you probably never have to do anything. Oh, there's some of the, the quarries right now. Um, <laughs> granted, you'd have nothing in your water for your plants to water feed off of. You'd need to use either root tabs or some sort of substrate. But even if you had no substrate, no plants, you could pack this with fish. Or you can go the other way and do absolutely no filtration like I do downstairs in that other tank. And you can still run over two inches per gallon of fish in a tank, and it can be totally healthy. Now, if you're new at this, always check your levels. Learn what it means. I The, the last little tip that I will give that is not part of this, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not an input to the system that you can work with, per se, but what it is, is it's, it's an indicator. So get yourself some fish that you know are sensitive, but you're not too attached attached to and I, that might, might be too rude to people but for me that's ruby tetras in a lot of tanks i'll put like five ruby tetras they're very small some of them don't even get up to three-fourths of an inch they're very small they're very peaceful they don't even eat baby shrimp oh i got a bunch of hebrosis quarries in here too that i forgot to mention um and they don't they don't eat your your shrimp or anything like that that i've ever seen um and what they do though is they discolor very quickly. If you are having an issue with nitrites, ruby tetras will instantly turn kind of this pinkish washed out clear color. Whereas they can be as, you know, as red as, as a ruby when they're real happy and frisky and eating or, or, or spawning. That's my little trick fish for hot low uh, or for lower level ph you know so that means higher acidity planted tanks in my opinion that's my little indicator species because they also don't like water that's too acidic for too long or they get into trouble themselves there and they also need some oxygenation those fish now there's lots of fish you could do this with maybe you just know guppies really well and you can tell when they're washed out guppies have a higher threshold so you need to know like okay i have harder water this isn't like Alex's tank. It's not acidic planted. Maybe it's uh, more cichlid oriented or, you know, shellies or guppies and live bears. And you got some crushed coral and your TDS is like 300 and your um, your other, uh, you know, your um, KH is high, your GH is high and your um, pH is up in the alkaline range. Well, that's going to then have different inputs. So select a different fish because obviously these fish, these aren't high alkaline fish. I've got some guppies, but these are crossed with endlers and they're blue panda guppies. And so they've become very tame. Neutral water is their new hard water compared to the wild. So, um, I just thought I'd, I'd say that. Now let's sit and chat. Let me get through some of your questions. Let me get my Dr. Pepper as well. Because the doctor needs to be in the house when we're doing these house calls. And I'll show you a secret uh, I showed you all the other day, too. But um, you guys are going to see it before he does. Because you've stuck with me during this live stream. And uh, you my people. But I'm working on it. It's, it's not even halfway done. Lucas Bretz wants a green water wizard of himself 
being made. So it's going to be LRB Aquatics. It's going to have kind of a Milky Way galaxy spiral of all these fish getting bigger and then smaller towards the center. And then his his name, and then we're going to put some plants and fish in here. But he's going to be a green, rather than a, a gray or black or white wizard. And he's going to have a staff that is a light bulb that radiates green water, which feeds the fry and feeds the babies everywhere. So that, he's going to have some merch. It's going to be your sneak peek. This is the last update I can do. I don't want to show it any more done. That's 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 the teaser for his stuff. And also, if, if you want to hire me to do something, I do that kind of stuff from time to time. Um, sometimes I get overloaded, but, uh, you know, I do it. And let's see here. Let me get this set up. Oh, yeah, there's a good view. Uh, oh, you can tell I went to the wet spot, right? Let's Let's set this up. I've never broadcast from the kitchen before. But let's do it. Let's, why not? Let's let's change things up. Okay. All right. So let me just say here, I have totally neglected chat. I feel like scrolling through chat at this point. I'm doing it right now. And I'm scrolling, 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 scrolling. We got an hour's worth of chat. And I'm going to see the super chats because they stand out like a sore thumb. But please, if you're still here, let's, let's, get, um, let's get some c comments coming in fresh. Uh, I know that that's annoying, but let's get that. Um, Let's see here. Um, David says, uh, no membership join option on mobile, and I don't know a, a lap, uh, own a laptop. I don't know what to do. Also, Bumblebee Gobies and Pea Puffer. Um, Bumblebee Gobies and Pea Puffers are usually okay because uh, Bumblebee Gobies will hide at the bottom on surfaces. They cling to surfaces, and they're very peaceful. Um, uh, the the Pea Puffers are territorial, and so they're going to – they may – peck at them and may kind of try to like scare them off and posture and they turn sideways and they kind of jitter and do these moves but they're not really going to attack them usually you might get one with a hair up his nose once in a while that's you know goes on a terror but other than that it's it's pretty rare so um i would say you can give it a try it definitely needs to be planted and you definitely need to block lines of sight um and so yeah um now Let's get to the question part of this. Anything relevant to overstocking or also other questions are fine too at this point. Thanks for uh, standing by with my rant there or my uh, monologue, my diatribe, whatever you want to call it. <sighs> Always fills you up, never lets you down. I think that might be someone else's motto, but in any case. All right, so... I want to say hi to everyone. Also, I wanted to say on mobile, there should be an option to join. I think you just have to make sure, one, you're signed in, and I think you might need the app. You may either need the app, or you might need to click desktop mode. If, if, that, if I'm completely off page, then it might be that. And before I take on any more jobs, after uh, the one that I've been working on for Lucas forever, uh, he first asked me about this, like, I don't know, May or something, um, probably before that. I need to finish Ginger's project because I am an awful person who never got to her her last illustration. But I appreciate you, Ginger. I see that you're here. Um, all right, so I'm going to start with this uh, This from uh, Foxy's Fishes. Uh, Roxanne, what's going on? Uh, so we've got, I noticed a very skinny zebra Daniel this morning, and I'm thinking wasting disease. I already moved it. How do you recommend I treat it? So if it's very skinny, what I would recommend, treat it for parasites first. Um, it could be stress too. That's on the rarer side, you know, realistically with fish, especially with Daniels. They're, they really come from, unless you spawn them, they come from uh, an environment where there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Daniels and things are very com communicable. Um, now, if it is a wasting disease, then cleaning it out with the parasite guard um, I would also do a general cure after that. And honestly, you can use kind of the trio that aquarium co-ops always um, kind of recommended. Uh, fish wasting is a tough one. I found that, you know, doing a salt dip also helps them if you're really worried about them. Uh, you do a salt dip, then you put them back into a QT tank, uh, ideally, or even a bucket, you know, with some with an aerator. But make sure you put a lot of leaves in there, some tannins. You can this time of year is perfect. Get oak leaves, alder berries or alder cones, 
that are dried out already. You can toss those in there and that's gonna build up their slime coat. That's gonna build up all the enzymes, the tannins and things, gonna get their slime coat going. And their slime coat is kind of like us sweating when we're sick or whatnot. I mean, it has a direct correlation to their temperature, to their the sensitivity of their onodontodes if they're catfish and, and to their lateral line and their sensory array. So treating the outside of the fish surprisingly does a lot for um, strengthening their fortitude. I mean, I've had fish that have had worms time after time after time. Their whole life they had worms for five years and they died with worms and I never got them out of their system fully. And yet they were healthy and they weren't skinny and I didn't have to force feed them a ton. And that was because they were healthy in every other way. If you just once in a while you'd see a worm and nothing I had would knock it out. Even Levamisol when there was some wild caught nastiness going on but I would separate it uh, and I think that will help um, okay Danny says I'm on mobile and I have the join option yeah so if you guys want to be a member um, really you know I, I've explained it a bunch of times and I don't want to preach too much about it but but essentially if you like what I'm doing if you like the more in-depth dives that I do either weekly or bi-weekly sometimes I get into it on live streams actually but you know, if I get into the researching stuff that really takes me hours of research and I've got all these source articles, I've got videos I've watched, maybe there's an hour-long documentary I watched that's just on a side tangent, semi-related, uh, about chemistry or something. I'm sharing all this stuff that allows me to arrive at the th where I've gotten to with my mid-level subscribers, with the $4.99 subscribers. For $1.99, I'm just ensuring that you're going to get chats where I'm going to do a members only chat. I haven't decided if it's once or twice a month. I don't like the members only chat, but at this point the channel is big enough that I can't answer everyone every day and I hate that about it. And so if you're willing to put up $1.99, I get a dollar, what is it, $1.34 uh, of that um, after YouTube takes their cut. So for paying me $1.34, I wish I could just say, get out of here, YouTube, and I could just give it to you through PayPal or something. They don't allow you to give away memberships, though. Um, and there's plenty of people who moderate, and I want to give them a membership, too. Um, I've paid some of my mods lately. Uh, I hope that helps. I don't know. Um, today, also, I figured I mentioned I gave away $35 gift, well, gift card, let's call it that. It was just cash. But um, to uh, one of the people from the Aquascaping contest that... Uh, my post office has crazy hours lately with both the voting. Also, we have a homeless encampment at our post office in my neighborhood. And the next one over is being remodeled. So it's kind of out of the way. And twice I went and it's just like, you know what, it's going to be easier. So I just sent him some money and he got some substrate. Sounds like it worked out okay. All right. Um, so yeah, if you like my content, please join. Uh, it, and if you have free, if you have spare money that you'd like to contribute, you can join for a month and then peace out. I, I totally get it. Um, and the higher the level, yes, there are some perks that I threw in, but honestly, it's just saying, Alex, I like what you're doing. I want you to spend 40 hours a week. I want you to spend 50 hours a week on this. And I want you to be able to, um, rather than, uh, having to do all these freelance gigs that I also do on the side, uh, they're unrelated to fish. So... Uh, that's kind of the spiel there. Spiel there. Uh, you can subscribe. I'm not really cutting off any content. Also, the other thing is if you're a subscriber, I'm also posting more discount codes. Uh, if I get anything from a manufacturer where they say, hey, you can pass this on to your subscribers, but I'm like, eh, I'm not ready to endorse that group. I don't know their products or maybe I don't even like their products, but they give me a code. I'm not going to, I won't put my name on the line for that, but I'll share that with people who have been around long enough, intimate enough in the members only section that, you know, that kind of info or unsubstantiated stuff that I can, you know, or, or maybe personal stuff that I just, maybe I don't want to vent it to just the most casual people. And, um, you know who you are. Cause I talk to you one-on-one, -on -one, plenty of people who aren't members or can't afford it. Um, and I, I don't take any offense to that, but I'm just saying, I, I'm trying to figure out a way where I'm not anything you saw in the last four years on this channel is not going away. Hopefully it's getting better. And then, you know, we'll incorporate extras um, beyond that. Uh, all right, Mridgel says, uh, Mridgel Singh says, 
Uh, secret history, uh, how would you explain the copa flowering underneath water? I've got some stems flowering underwater. So there's two great ways that that happens. Um, one is going to be that you have a red wavelength of light. The other is going to be that you bought it in an immersed form and it just never fully transferred. Sometimes that can take months to fully occur. And if you get the right length of light or intensity of light on it, and length, I mean... Um, time and wavelength, the reds spectrum, the beginning of the spectrum versus the blues, uh, you can get it to flower underwater. I've had, uh, surprisingly, it looks crazy. I'll have, maybe I'll find a picture for it. So this is another thing for like members. If I say, I have a picture of that from five years ago, I'm trying to put stuff like that up. So inquiring minds, it's, it's stuff you may not need. I'm not gatekeeping anything. It's stuff that you might find cool. I hope that that's, I hope that's how this comes off. Um, let's see here. Um, but I, uh, I flowered some, um, uh, Cabamba Furcata underwater and had beautiful purple and orange flowers. It was beautiful. Uh, and it was because I bought it immersed and two months later, it still was just kind of, eh, I don't know what's going on. And I don't know what causes it to, to, to do that sometimes. Um, Jason says, wouldn't you like to be a pepper to um, a Dr. Pepper? Is that their motto? Uh, Sabine, oh, Drench Aquatics, what's going on? Uh, Sabine Gray, uh, Epsom salt baths may help draw out some fluid. One teaspoon of Epsom salt pure to one gallon of tank water uh, or condition new water. He can stay in the bath up to 20 minutes twice a day. Yeah, I think that's great advice. What that's going to do, that salt is going to draw out, out, out um, the enzymes in the slime coat. And uh, also, uh, through osmosis, salt always moves to a less salty condition. So if, if you have a salty inside, uh, water is going to come in there and try to dilute the salt. If it has an osmotic membrane or if it has a cell wall with ion channels that allow things to open and close. Um, let's see here. Uh, wow, that's really nice, uh, Mridual. Man, I'm going to get your name right someday. Uh, <laughs> I'm just so mealy-mouthed with that. Uh, and thank you so much. I see that there, we've got 150, we've got 170 some people in here earlier. Uh, if you could hit that like button, you just click out of chat for a sec and hit that thumbs up. Or you can hit that thumbs down and tell me to go F myself. Either way, I'd just like to know what we're doing tonight. Am I gonna am I gonna be hanging in with myself, or am I gonna be hanging with friends? Uh, Mary, thank you so much, sweetie, for a thanks sticker. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's folks like Mary that I grow close to, and you know, over time on YouTube, on FishTube, on every tube, people get close. They come and go, and I hope that this is a channel. You know, I've had plenty of channels where. I'm obsessed with content and I go through all their videos and then, you know, I just don't get the updates and I kind of forget about it and I don't take that personally at all. I understand that's how things work. That's how it rotates. That's how they keep YouTube interesting. That's how they keep you buying and addicted. Um, but stop by and say hi if you think about me sometime in the future, even if you're over fish at some point. Um, it's always good to see people because people like Mary, I know even if she left today, Anytime I ever see her in the future, she will be a welcome and loved friend, just like Jason, just like, uh, you know, so many of you. I mean, there's too many to name. I have had some real great heart to hearts with folks in the last few months, really since the lockdown. Um, you know, I've talked to so many people with uh, post-traumatic stress issues, with insomnia or pain issues like me. Uh, with uh, family issues going on. And, you know, we don't always have to talk about fish. Some of our chats late night lately have been not really fish related. They've just kind of been group therapy because we're like-minded people. And yeah, we can kind of bounce in and out of fish. But I just thought, um, you know, I want you guys to know that also the Facebook group, if you guys are ever having a hard time, um, whether you struggle with mental health, you know, whether that's depression, schizophrenia, anxiety, whatever it may be, um, I really don't want this to be a judgmental place except for the of those who are judgmental and hurtful to others. I mean, for those people, we can judge them and tell them to go elsewhere. But other than that, I mean, really, this our community, I haven't had to delete a single post on the Facebook group, which has the same name as this channel, essentially. Um, so if you need support, 
go there. You can leave a comment. Like I said, it's getting harder for me to find every comment. It takes a few hours every day in the morning and at night to stay on top of that. So if I get behind, I, uh, I, I really get behind sometimes. Uh, a uh, great lesson today. Well, thank you, Mary. Uh, and Muppet, thank you for moderating this, of course. I handed out a bunch of wrenches, and I don't know what the hell's going on with YouTube. YouTube, you can kiss my... You know what? I gave out all these wrenches, and now, like, no one has them. I don't know what's happening. Uh, secret history. Have you tried breeding uh, Bararis or know any information about the matter? Yeah. I have, um, I have a video on it, <coughs> on, on Rasboras, um, I've done Phoenix, Rasbora, a lot of the micro Rasboras I've done, um, very low acidity to the point where it kills the bacterial filter a lot of times, you're talking four or five, um, and basically they're egg scatters, so you put, you get the parents all prepped in, say, like a 6.5 or 7 pH, you feed them lots of live food and you separate the males and females as best you can by bloated belly. You feed them together for a week and pretty soon the, the, the females will start to grow eggs in their belly. Some species you can tell the difference like um, Samfong Rasbora is kind of similar. Um, even small tetras are very similar. Uh, you can really tell um, the females, sometimes it's a color difference. Usually the more vivid ones and the ones with um, the belly, duh. Um, will have, will be the female, or the, the more colorful ones will be the males, and then the ones with the bellies will be the females. Uh, those are small fish, they're hard to tell, sometimes you screw it up, but that's okay. Um, they usually spawn in the mornings, uh, most of them. Some will spawn in the evenings. And they like, um, what they like is that really tannic, acidic black water after you've prepped them, the males and females separate getting live food, they're getting that hunting, killing instinct, they're getting that like feisty uh, cock of the walk kind of thing, the cat's pajamas thing, and then you put them together and they're like, yeah, let's get this. Uh, it's date night, so um, you just need to put down material where the eggs will either fall between um, glass beads or stones that they can't get in between. And then, uh, you know, also the other thing that'll work, because some of them do stick eggs and some of them just disperse them um but then you can put um moss or uh leaves or whatever dead leaves work really well like just a, a layer like three or four thick of kind of crunchy dead leaves works really well too and that'll get the tannins right up there high in like a 2.5 gallon and dark keep it dark for them but um dark then you brighten it a little uh, when it's um, the daytime just so they get that kind of feel and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna drop the temperature five to five to ten degrees really um, Fahrenheit uh, I'd say two to four degrees Celsius two to three degrees Celsius and um, you're going to add low TDS fresh water, which represents the rainy season, which in Southeast Asia, that's what's really going to trigger them is that signal of our little ponds are flooding over. We need to procreate so all of our fry get out and, and proliferate. Um, Jarhead Entrepreneur, what's going on? Uh, hoorah. Got a 20, li uh, 20 long. I always think leader. Uh, I'm reading too many European forums. Tanks that up for plants. Ideas for fish to breed for profit. Thinking about apistas, but I haven't decided. Um, for 20 long, I would say, honestly, live bears. Um, if you can get a, a an up-and-coming popular live bear, or one that no one's ever seen in your area, you name the price. You fake it till you make it. Fish is like art to a certain degree. If you're the only one with them, they're worth whatever people think they're worth. And... That is influenced by you. Now, I'm of the mindset that I don't like to just say like, oh, I've got this guppy no one's seen before because it's a freak. And so you're going to pay out the nose. You know, I, I, I think there's a happy medium between that and being just greedy. But find something like uh, maybe some goodie ads. They can get a little big, actually. But, you know, maybe some little tiger teddies or some uh, mini carplets uh, or some of the unusual and endangered uh, live bears, 
that or pseudomagills maybe, and you could do a spawning mop that you pull, and then you could just use a bucket or a little jar to hatch them. And then what that allows you to do is have thick underbrush and, and uh, stem plants. You can be cutting the stem plants, making money off those, and uh, if you get a decent light, and then you can also do, you know, mystery snails, or you could do ram's horn snails. Um, that sounds funny, or, or trumpet snails, or whatever, and you maybe get a buck for them, but if you can get like a blue ram's horn snail uh, morph with like a silver shell, or a, a albino that's bright pink with like the leopard print gold shell, people will pay a couple bucks for those, and you just have to cull them. But I think that way you can get a couple species going, and um, yeah, so there's that. Um, la 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 la, Jason, you never got uh, to that Rembrandt reproduction I paid you for. It was during the Helsinki conference, and I have a wit I have witnesses, sir. My uh, <laughs> barrister's correspondence is forthcoming. Well. Take your job and shove it, Mr. Fancy Man. Uh, Dr. Pepper, it's the banquet soda. Um, let's see, Atkins, my 55 cichlid tank reaches 160 parts per million of nitri nitrate. I'm doing about twice weak water changes, but I'm told nitrates over 60 is bad, and by others, it is not until over 500 or 600. Well, how are your fish? Are they spawning? Are they happy? Um, you know, if they're chilling and you're changing the water, it's aerated. I wouldn't worry about that. I mean, 160 is borderline for a lot of fish. However, I've noticed that harder water fish, uh, Tanganyikan cichlids, for instance, they can take a lot more, both whether it's brackish water, because that's TDS, or whether it's nitrates and nitrates. They seem to be a little resistant to it. I don't know if there's something similarly caustic about those uh, chemicals and in that environment naturally. Same with some of the limestone rich cichlids and live bears from Central America. Um, they can just, I mean, I've seen it so blood red that you'd have no idea what col how many nitrites there are in a, in a guppy tank before. And if they've slowly been walked to that point, then it's okay. But I would say if you're doing the water change and the nitrites are dropping precipitously quickly, um, I would then reassess how you're doing the water change. Maybe more often, even though you're doing it twice, I mean, maybe you do it daily for a little while and do 20% or 10%, like a low one, and see if you can kind of bring it down like this rather than kunch, and then it goes up and then kunch. You know, um, that would be my recommendation on that. Uh, but also, if you're stressing about it, get get another um, air stone in there or get another sponge filter in there. Um, and uh, did we talk about your pH? We didn't. So just make sure that, so, I mean, I'm assuming you're not, keep, if you're keeping a, did you say African cichlids? No, you didn't. So if you have uh, South American cichlids, you could have a pH lower than six. I don't know your water characteristics. But uh, if that's the case, get it up into the neutral zone a little closer, or, or you know, 6.5 or 7, and uh, your, your nitrifying bacteria works optimally at neutral um, to slightly acidic water generally. Brian, I'm having an issue you kind of touched on. My city water comes from the tap at 9.5 pH. Holy cow, man. Whoa. But within two days, my tank's pH drops below uh, to the 6.8. So what that's go what's going on there is your uh, chlorine, chloramine, ammonia. It's going to break down into ammonia. Uh, and um, basically, same thing happens if, if you oxygenate or um, a bag of fish that's been in sitting for a while. You open it and you can spike the, the, the pH can change due to... The buildup of ammonia. It's not harmful until the pH changes and then it can be harmful. So what I would do is I honestly would get that like so the thing is that that's just dangerous. That's a dangerous swing. You should buffer your water with something so you need to dechlorinate but really it sounds like you might have some chloramine compound that's even I've heard like in Missouri and a couple other places they're using chloramine as well as you know fluoride and some other things and altogether that can be rough for a fish chemists like us to figure out, you know, what 
what piece of the puzzle do we need to change? Is that um, is that a uh, an issue? Clearly, it's it's a compound that's breaking down. If you don't use dechlorinator, I'm curious to see what happens. I do a bucket dechlorinate and one not dechlorinated. If if you find out that the dechlorinator takes care of that um, the pH, then you know that it's the chloramine compounds in there that are causing it. Uh, if if uh, if it doesn't make a difference, uh, if you use dechlorinator or not, and it still takes time, uh, then you're just going to have to wait for the degradation and evaporation of whatever chemical that is. But I'd get some C-chem stability or some coral or even a little bit of carbon, active carbon liquid form, I guess you could use. I don't usually recommend that stuff because it usually goes to do nothing. But in your case, it may help just kind of buffer that water a little bit. Um, let's see here. Uh, do, 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 everybody's waving. I don't know what happened, but uh, bye or hi to whoever. Um, let's see here. Muppet, thanks for your hard work, my dear. Uh, Atkins Nature, my African cichlids do fine with high nitrates. Yeah, like Dan's saying, I mean, it just depends on the fish. Some fish are totally chill with it. And even it, it's even down to the individual fish and how they were raised. If you get them from Gary Lang and they're raised in some pristine water and they're like rainbow fish that are, you know, uh, pampered their whole lives to exactly what their wild parameters are, that's going to respond very differently to a, than a fish that came from a farm and has like a rundown immune system and it's been living in crap the whole life. Um, that can go both ways, but um, yeah. Uh, if your betta is pine coning, it could be the sign of dropsy starting. Usually that's a real bad sign, honestly. I hate to tell you that, but I mean, do the salt bath, do the anti-parasite and general cure or antifungal kind of combo. And um, I mean, you can also throw in an antibiotic if you are, you know, just secondary infections. I doubt that's what it is. People do that as kind of a, uh, just to cover all their bases. But in my mind, one less medication is one less stressful thing that's not in nature. And uh, fish do have biological responses to help themselves, like slime coats, that things like salt, diet. Um, so giving them a good diet, if you can get them fresh food, a lot of times that'll help them eat live food, you know, or frozen food. And um, blood worms that have been fortified with something other than just uh, blood worm guts, you know, some vitamins, that kind of helps. <laughs> um, I have been, uh, freedom for one and all says I have been experimenting with biosinosis filters and biohome media for nitrates, 75 gallon hap and, uh, that's haplochromus I'm taking, uh, and peacock 15 fish tank doesn't get over 10 parts per million nitrate nitrate traits in a week and 75 gallon uh, Mabuna 25 fish under 10 parts per million weekly. Wow, uh, freedom for all, that's pretty cool. Uh, I would like to hear about that. If you want to hop into the comments after this, uh, sometimes it takes 12 to 24 hours for these to, to load once I've been live streaming. But man, I think a lot of us would like to hear uh, what you're doing because that, that's pretty interesting. That's, some low numbers. I mean, I don't know how often you're doing water changes, but that's pretty cool. Um, so, uh, Novice Quirce, congrats on 15,000 subs, Alex. Thank you. You know, I said it, and the days before, I had like 45 subs a day, like a lot of subs. It was going really quickly. And then the day before, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm 52 subs short. I'm like, I bet we can make it tomorrow. And it took like three or four days and I lost 12 subs when I started talking about it. YouTube put out a video saying you're not supposed to say that word so much uh, because they're worried about people doing uh, small channels doing uh, tit for tat on that kind of thing and just running around. So uh, there's that. Uh, Van Halen Bowler says, uh, hey, people, show Alex some love with a love like. Yeah, show me a thumb. I want to see your thumbs, people. Uh, also, Fruit Loops and Cheerios you like. All right, well, that's cool. Later, D. Michael. Uh, Animal Dude, 4,000. Do you know Power Man 5,000? 
Um, let's see, what, what do we got going? Uh, gnarly fish tanks, hello. Um, bring back the blue fingernails and the tie-dye. Yeah, uh, you know, I will. I will. Um, there's not really any reason that I haven't other than that my wife hid them. She literally bought me new shirts and stuff. She's like, you know what? We're just hanging out in the house and... I, I, I just, you're in your pajamas and wearing tie-dye all the time. And so she bought me pants and a shirt. And I, she's been shopping online. It's a problem. She's not home yet, but it's a problem. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see here. Um, do, 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 do. I need to buy some. Uh, there's this guy named Tie-Dye Todd in South Carolina. Um and he is incredible. Uh, for 15 years, I've been buying his stuff since a road trip in my early 20s, or in my teens, I guess, late teens. Um, I use API Master Test Kit. Strips are too expensive. Yeah, so strips are expensive. I agree. Uh, but you can cut them in half, which helps a little, or you can steal them. Just kidding. Don't do that. Um, there's a ghost behind me. Cool. Hey, ghost. Oh, there's a bunch of ghosts behind me. Yeah. A bunch of cheesy little ghosts. My wife, you know, I give her crap about it, but I love that she decorates for the season. It makes it makes my life better. I like to be all, you know, what's the word? Sarcastic and uh, jaded about the holidays, but secretly I love them. Don't let her see this. Do, 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 do. Hey Jess, what's going on? Um, yes, please join Alex, is awesome. Well, I appreciate that. Jarhead says I battle with PTSD anxiety for 20 years in the core, uh, so my ears always open if anyone needs it. Just hit me up on my Instagram or my channel. That's very kind of you. Um, I know a lot of people have extended that same sentiment, and I, I'm serious, use this community, you guys. I just lost somebody in my life uh, when I was in Walla Walla, actually, um, at 34, and uh, he was a vet, and um, talked to someone. He had two little boys. Not even that snapped him out of things, but um, uh, definitely talk to somebody if you're having trouble. I know what that's like. I do. Take it a day at a time. Clearly, you probably have fish if you're here. Just sit, breathe, look at your fish. Today may be the worst day ever. That might be true. Um, tomorrow might get worse, but it's going to get better at some point. You're going to laugh again. You're going to be happy again. And if you're just bored, if you just, that's the feeling in life, like just not looking forward to anything, that can also be depression. Uh, but, I mean, one, challenge yourself and do something for others. Go help someone else. Um, go help a group of people you don't even like. That is my challenge to you. Um, I know we all help animals here, clearly, but if you're feeling down, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling hopeless, go help someone who's worse off than you. There's someone probably worse off than you. You're missing a leg, but you still get around. I mean, you could be missing your other leg. You could be on fire. I mean, there's always something worse. I've been through the ringer in my life, both health and emotionally and you know, all sorts of ways too, and just be grateful for every day. Some days we don't feel so grateful, but um, I challenge you to go find someone you dislike, um, not a bad person necessarily, but someone you don't get along with even, and do something nice for them with no hope of anything in return. You will feel better. Um, and like Ridgewell says, uh, Alex has created a very close-knit, supportive community. Yeah, we're going on four years now, and um, we've had people, we've lost people in the community. I mean, we've had probably 30,000 people come and go between subscribing and not subscribing, people who weren't subscribed. Um, and there's been some great people. There's been people who've had health problems, you know, just cancer, things like that. And... Um, a lot of us in here have, have, have gone through it. We know the people in the community. We've done fundraisers for each other. I mean, so uh, this is a tight-knit community, and um, you'll find that on a lot of channels, especially the smaller channels. I mean, you find it on some big channels too, but um, 
it's easier to facilitate on a, a smaller channel under, you know, say 50,000 or something. Um, uh, Psychedelic Hippocampus, I will join when I get my land lot uh, paid off in a couple months. Right now, I only have around 50 for groceries. Hey, no sweat, buddy. Uh, Psychedelic Hippocampus, love that name. Uh, I know it's a brain part, but hippos in college is all I can think about. Uh, and... Let's see here. Burp, 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 burp. Uh, what did I miss? I missed something. Would it be helpful to add Bacter AA for a few weeks before I get shrimp to build up some biofilm? You can. It's a little expensive. I think it's a fine product. I think it's overpriced. Um, you can add fish food to your aquarium, especially if you have plants. Add fish food. Test it. Make sure your nitrates aren't too high. And um, I would totally recommend that. I mean, honestly... Uh, it it kind of does the same thing. It, you're just giving some food for some bacteria to start growing. Throw some catapa leaves. Get some dead uh, cellulose structures in there. Uh, some leaves, some scaffolding or choya wood, something like that. And um, bacteria is going to colonize it no matter what. You, you can't stop it. Uh, New Mexico Aquatics, Little Bobby. Um, do you have a favorite method of breeding... Um, oh man, I always mess up this name. <laughs> uh, Fundalo uh, Panchex Gardenera. I've only bred them once, and it was 20 years ago. That's actually one of the first non-live bears I did breed was a Gardenera um, Killy of, of sorts. I can't remember even, like, which one it was. Um, but, um, I think it was from Gambia or something, but... Whatever. Um, no, I'm not really the best person to ask, honestly. I will admit when I, <laughs> I'm just talking out my butt, um, I would assume that you probably want to get some sort of peat moss, uh, probably want a very shallow container. A lot of the breeders have containers that are like two inches deep and they put the water in that. They get let it get real uh, tannin rich or acidic. They let the TDS kind of creep up for a little while. And a lot of those fish reach maturity in three to four months and then die. I mean, they're they're an incredible species, but they're kind of oddballs. Uh, kind of like the, um, I mean, all those African killies are like that. But there's Asian ones, and they're like that too. But I really don't have the best um, idea on that. I could suggest checking out the American... Killy Association. And again, if you join the channel um, member-wise, like this is another thing where if I say something in a show like this, I'm going to try in the future to keep track of better. And if I say like, check out this or talk about Project Piaba and blah, 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 um, I'm going to try to be posting you guys some hyperlinks and or articles about those things in the community section or on Patreon or whatever. Um, if you want to do Patreon instead of membership, I totally get it. If you want to send me PayPal, I get it, but I just don't have a good way to disseminate information that way, unfortunately. Um, okay, let's see here. Uh, Atkins Nature's Aqua... Oh, wait. You're just listing some awesome fish. You're just bragging. Okay. Uh, I need a dab. It's best to wait another month after cycling. They'll prefer a matured tank. Yeah, that's true with most fish in general. Um, I mean, if you could wait six months before putting fish in a tank, you just put some snails and shrimp in there at three months or something and put plants in right away, that would be super. But, you know, what are you going to do? I want my fish now. <laughs> Atkins still listing stuff. Uh, yeah, but add it while I'm waiting or is the total waste of money? Um, mm, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't buy Bacter AE to start with, honestly. I would get some natural light on your tank if, if you can put it in a place in the room, even like where I'm at, not sunbeams on it, you don't want that, but some natural ambient light. That'll grow some algae, some biofilm that's uh, photosynthetic uh, sensitive. And then um, your, your other bacteria is gonna come whenever it comes, uh, but you do need to give it some food. Now, what you could do is you could take a little bit of uh, lettuce, 
You take some lettuce, put that in a jar uh, of fish tank water, and just walk away for like a week. And then just take a turkey baster or whatever and just take some of that water, which is going to look kind of milky. That's infusoria. You could put that in the water if you really felt like it. Um, or even just a little piece of lettuce uh, or a little some dead leaves. Lettuce is uh, different in that it has the active, um, whatever it is that's on there, uh, the, the little microbes and creatures, they're already there. And so you're already it's going to be in the water column after that and actually they live in tandem with mucus from snails so long term that helps them a lot uh so you could do that but but the bottom line is uh all these things where we're putting food in there what is that food for it's really for the babies more than the adults adult shrimp will eat anything they'll eat each other um you know they eat their own shells they eat they dig through their own poop and eat the non-poop of it whatever, um, they're going to find food. Plus, you, you're going to feed your shrimp, right? I'm sure you bought shrimp food if you're thinking about Bacter AE. I have literally gone months without feeding my Neocaridinas at times. Now, Caridinas and some of the other shrimp get a little more sensitive, but really that Bacter AE is it, where it comes in handy is when you're growing large amounts of shrimp in a small space and you need more surface area for bang for your buck. It's really the babies that um, are, are my... Uh, concern there um let's see here uh i have a bunch of rare plants and nobody wanted to buy them on facebook marketplace or craigslist aquarium main uh as in gucci main not as in the state what rare plants do you have i'm just curious um all right cichlids lurking that's all good alishan hello um Let's see here. Atkins Water, what is your nitrate reading? Oh, wait, you guys are talking to each other. Okay. Yeah, if you're talking to me, do what Drew Sample just did. It helps me a lot. And say, at Secret History Living in your aquarium, the longest name ever. You should have changed it before you got over a thousand subs, you dumb dumb. Um, I should have, but it kind of says what I wanted to say about the channel. Um, but that, that will let me see it. Also, if you're a channel member, I know it's dumb. I'm not just saying this. You get a green icon next to your name. And so when I'm scrolling that color, it pulls your eye towards it. And I will be selecting little images that are cute and kitschy. So we can play that little game and you can give me more money. Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think it's fun too. So, um, but I'll be putting little icons rather than just a green or whatever color this or that. And if you're a member for a longer time, you get more badges and you got to catch them all like Pokemon. Uh, Drew Sample though says, mostly on topic, I've got a 10 gallon with nine sparkling gourami. Oh, uh, well, yesterday I saw some mating. Now all are at the bottom of the tank acting funny. I think they're eating their eggs because they're little bastards. Uh, sorry about my language. Um, but they are. They're, they're them, Battis, uh, Elisomas, they're kind of, they eat a lot of their babies. Um, if, if they're, if they get in that groove, some never do. And they actually ask, act like little tiny cichlids and it's amazing. I don't know what sets them off. Um, pea puffers are kind of like that too. They can be amazing, sweet little cichlids with amazing personality or they can be monsters. Um... But I would guess that's what they're doing. Uh, also, it could be that the babies did hatch. Some of them hatch, and there was an instinct for them to bed down and hide. So you could add some more uh, underbrush cover for them, some some moss, some sawasertong, uh, some, uh, I don't know, you could cut up some hornwort or pearlweed or wisteria, whatever you've got and uh, tuck that at the bottom, kind of keep the parents and the adults hidden from each other a bit, just, just cram it in there. Um, yep, I need a dab, it says, grow some algae on the sides of your tank instead of the Bacter AE. Yeah, I mean, that, that keeps shrimp grazing for forever. Um, I mean, unless you're in like a five gallon and you have a hundred shrimp in there. I mean, then yes, it, it does pay to have Bacter AE. Also, there are some shrimp that are used to Bacter AE, like the Blue Bolts or like a Pinto or like some of these expensive like fishbone, herringbone, 
uh, dancing man, like $100 Caradinas that have been babied their whole life by just pristine conditions, if they grow accustomed to eating a certain way. And so they don't even interpret that as food until they're like starving. And that can have health consequences. So as long as we're not talking about those like really high end fish uh, or uh, shrimp, I wouldn't sweat it. Um, my pH is 8.4 out of the tap and staying that high was told wood or the like betta leaves would help. Yeah, that should um, bet. Uh, wait, I was told some wood or like the Oh, the bet. So you're saying, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. So bet betta leaves, so catapa leaves, they're almond leaves, Indian almond tree leaves, and they come in sizes this big, I'm not kidding, to, you know, little teeny, like, little, I don't know, tea leaf size. And um, yes, they will add acidity to the water. Uh, wood will also, uh, the more tannic it is, the darker the wood, uh, the more tea colored your water gets the more that's going to happen. Now, if you don't have any sort of um, st stability, as in buffering, as in KH and GH, um, even just a smidge of it will help you from getting swings in that. But if you add too much of that, then you start getting into the alkaline territory. So it's kind of a fine, fine line, but um, leaves aren't going to hurt most of the time unless you've just super saturated your tank. Um, let's see here. I've been trying some biome media. They recommend API stress coat as chlorine remover and say some removers can harm uh, beneficial bacteria production. Yes, that is true. Um, yes, and, and the reason that is is because it takes their food away. They can't, so the way uh, de dechlorinators work is you've got this molecule of of chlorine or chloramine, chloramine will be this big, okay? It'll be a football instead of a softball. And it can do this damage. Pretend it's just spiky and on fire and it's flying around and it's just caustic and it's causing problems. And it can, it can attach wherever because it's got free ions or free neutrons or, wait, I'm not getting into it. It can attach to things chemically. I'm gonna get confused if I start going down that rabbit hole right now. Um, so, uh, I guess it would be ions. In any case, it is a salt. The dechlorinators are a sulfi sulfite salt. And all of them that I know of work that way. And what they do is they don't get rid of this molecule. They surround it in a matrix, in, in, in a hexagon, in a... 2D plane. Well, I guess that's 3D, but it, so they surround it in these hexagon shapes of molecules, basically. And then they're too big to do that damage, to dock and to be caustic and to interact or to rip other um, ion, or to turn other things into ions and rip stuff apart on a molecular level. Um, but that breaks down over time. Um, I like uh, Seachem Prime personally. API stress coat, yeah, I've used it. Um, the, it's got to be the plus one or whatever that has the dechlorinator in it. The best thing of all, if you really want to get into it, um, if you're if you're breeding really hard to breed fish, really low TDS fish, is rainwater, is RO water, distilled water that you get at the store, uh, or um, uh. RODI, did I say that already? RODI water. Um, and, and letting water evaporate, letting the chlorine evaporate out of your water uh, for a couple days. That being said, um, chlorine and chloramine has been shown in some studies to make egg membranes more rubbery. And in the case of pseudomagills, Gary Lang has shown that they uh, actually can't hatch sometimes. It's like Instead of being an eggshell, it's like um, a football, and it's like this rubbery vinyl nylon or, or whatever, and it's like trying to break out of a tire instead of a porcelain vase for the little fish. And so, um, because that same stuff bonds to the outside, because there is, uh, I think it's, 
I don't know what it must, it must be chlorine or ammonia or something in the outside of the membrane that it's docking with. I don't know what it is. But the same thing can be true with baby shrimp. I've seen those eggs not hatch when I've done tons of water changes and used a lot of dechlorinator. Um, so yeah, uh, but if you can stay away from it, do that. If you can't, then just use it sparingly. A lot of people will put a whole cap in with every five gallon bucket and you don't need to do that. Read the, read the directions and um, that can help. Uh, what's wrong with tie-dye? Uh, nothing, I don't think. Uh, any tips for prepping rainwater before using it in a tank? Uh, no, just collect it. Don't, I mean, ideally you want to have like a very, um, a, a slope or two slopes, two planes, slope, whether that's a roof or whatever. You want to have it coming down. You want that to be clear of debris. You don't want it to be on a roof that has, uh, you know, creosote tar or anything like that or um, tar paper any, even. Um, so you got to be a little bit careful about that. I mean, uh, using a tarp like a, a Kevlar or the, you know, the PVP or, or a vinyl or whatever they are, tarps, those are all, all those kind of things are fine. Uh, also, sheet metal works okay. Uh, it can oxidize, which isn't that big of a deal. Uh, but you can get things like iron or rust or, you know, other various issues from that in theory. But yeah, just keep that surface way clean uh, from growth and then have it come down into your cap catchment area. And um, I mean, ideally, you want to kind of clean that barrel out every so often maybe even hit it with bleach every so often that'll evaporate off but i'm what i'm saying is like you know use the water and if and if there's like this much always left in the bottom don't let that happen too long because you will start to get algae or um some sort of biome anyways establishing and is it good or bad it's probably neither and it might be good but uh i wouldn't take the chance so um yes Alex's wife makes him wear pants. Spousal abuse. Agreed. Totally agreed. Um, do you know how frustrating it is Halloween themed items for your birthday every year? <laughs> Very, I bet. I mean, my birthday's right after Christmas. <laughs> so I always got the, this is your Christmas and birthday present. And then I see like what everyone else got. And I'm like, that's a lie. <laughs> um... Uh, if I were a mod, I would uh, post a link to the 100 test strips. Uh, I'll make you a mod, buddy. Uh, I don't know what the problem is with Amazon, or pff, not Amazon, with uh, this, YouTube and Google uh, lately, but they're doing some uh, stuff. Novice Aquarius says, uh, my kid has chronic illness. Message me if you want to talk also if you're going through it. That's very kind. Love these words, says here, fishies. Uh, so I'm probably way behind because I just get to yakety, yakety, yak. Um, you know, I've got the, um, yeah, test strips can be off. And there's always user error when interpreting color. It, it's kind of a crap system. I wish they'd come up with a better one. Hopefully in the next 10 years, uh, we'll have some sort of mass spectrometry that, at least can figure out, you know, pH and stuff at a cheaper level. You can get digital test kits for all that stuff, um, but it gets expensive. Water flora. Wow, thank you. Um, Alex, you are informable, impeccable, integral, impressive, uh, indefatigable. I don't know that one. In, in, indef, indef, indefatigable. I don't know how to say that. Industrious, interesting, intrepid, and immers uh, immensely intelligent. Oh, 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 okay. Um, uh, yeah, talk to my agent. Um, thank you for paying for the honor to join me this hour or two, two hours. No, thank you, Waterfloor. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to say I know I'm not the dumbest person in the world, but I don't know everything, and my life, the joy I get out of life is learning new things from everybody I meet. And I mean that. You can learn something, even if it's what not to do, from everyone you meet, and you should be thankful for that. Um, we need to stop bickering about differences and love the ways we are the same. Uh, especially with this election coming up. Come on, guys. I know everybody's like, oh, it's the verge of civil war. Oh, this is going on, whatever. I just, we're humans. 
look at each other like like humans. I mean, would you take your fish out and like bang it on the table while it's alive and torture it? No, like, uh, why are we doing that verbally to each other, like on the internet? Stop, just knock it off, just chill out for a minute. People can have different opinions. It doesn't mean they're evil. It means that they have been in a certain rut. And maybe we can all agree to just get along on a few things. And then eventually the other things will melt away. Um, Alex, I have depression, bipolar, and anxiety. As long as I take my meds, I'm all good. T-Bone, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I've been manic before. Um uh, I'm mostly depressed usually, but I, I've experienced mania induced by um, like insomnia and stuff like that from pain and probably from drug use in past years and stuff. Um, but I understand the, the mindset and maybe not to the extreme, but I understand it to the degree that I, I really do sympathize for those of you going through it and you're not alone. You're not a weirdo. It is something that is very common and a lot of people will go through it, you know, as like say a midlife crisis and it may not come back. Other people will have to struggle with it a lot, but, um, whatever it is, you know, reach out. And so for some people, medications are the answer. Uh, for me, I take medication also for anxiety. Anxiety is crippling with, with my pain and just fear of not being able to provide for my wife and, um, physically not being manly enough or you know whatever that role of the protector that when i'm hobbling around because of my my legs aren't working from you know radiating nerve neuropathy and things like that um it can wear on you i mean I, that's just one little example in life so i understand and uh when life's wearing on you your fish aren't going to judge you um you can take care of them and just like i said when you do something for someone that you don't like or you don't agree with or you don't you can't associate with. If you think drug addicts are the scum of the earth, go get a sandwich and try to um, give some to a few. You might get one that tells you to F off. If you think fundamental Christians or Mormons are the most annoying people in the world and you're Mr. Richard Dawkins, then go to the church and you know meet someone and find some common ground on something. And I mean that. If you're feeling really down, Go connect with people in some way, or online, I suppose, but in, in person is much better. And just do something, or do something for the community at large. Uh, you'll feel better about you, I guarantee it. Might not happen right away, but you will feel better about you later. Hayden Tran, uh, does blue-green algae count as biofilm? Uh, no, not really. Uh, shrimp may peck at it. There are a lot of different cyanobacterias. Um, blue-green algae is a misnomer. It's actually a a uh, bacteria that has assimilated early on in life's uh, trajectory. It assimilated uh, chlorophyllic receptors uh, and life forms. It, its membrane engulfed those, and then its organelles, its mitochondria and its ribosomes and all that stuff, all the stuff you learned about in school, uh, then surrounded that in a protoplasm, which sounds Ghostbusteries like ectoplasm or something, but it's just a jelly substance made out of life, uh, made out of enzymes. Um, and that early life form is basically half plant or algae and half bacteria uh, when you look at it, but it does behave colony wise like a bacteria and in the ways that it responds to stimuli and uh, growth and things like that. It's similar to a bacteria as well as genetically. And then fungi is another route. And it's just, you know, it's interesting. It's mushroom season, everyone. And fungi is more closely related to humans than plants are, um, genetically speaking. So uh, they have not necessarily a nervous system, but they have a system of ions that can tell them to open and close just like venus flytraps they can open with uh, moisture levels they can sense uh, sugar levels and nitrogen levels their mycelium exchanges nitrogen for sugar with plants this is a point i've been harping on for a while they just came out with a paper i'll probably post it for the community uh for the members but i saw a paper not long ago and they in the paper they just casually mention it they were talking about douglas firs but they said um, that they have yet to, to 
investigate a plant in the wild that does not have some sort of mycorrhizal or fungi, its, it's um, mycelium or its root structure, its body, a mushroom or mold when you see it is just the fruiting body, just like a flower on a plant. The majority of its life, it's the vegetative or uh, hyphae mycelial state. Um, and that's the, that's the life, and that's when it's really networking and looks like a spider web or a city from the sky, the way the lights all interconnect. Um, I am in Seattle. Uh, speaking of sunlight, aqua balls, what's going on, buddy? Um, let's see. Little Bobby says, hit that like button, folks. Yeah, tap that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, Craig, we should have a Dr. Pepper icon. Uh, I don't know if I can do that legally. I don't really care. I mean, I'll do it till they say cease and desist or sponsor me. Um, but yeah, that's gotta be one of the badges or icons or something. We'll figure that out. Uh, uh, thoughts on acorn caps for the aquarium? Yeti, go for it, man. Acorn caps uh, should be okay. Don't use peanut shells. Um, <laughs> Lou. All right, guys, go to Father Fish if you haven't yet. Go to the channel, Father Fish. You'll find him. He looks like Jerry Garcia if he uh, was still with us. Uh, and were a man of the cloth at one point, uh, a cloth other than tie dye. And, uh, he has an amazing video. Uh, he's a wealth of knowledge, years of fish keeping, but he has an amazing video on that new Zis, uh, brine shrimp hatchery. The one that's $49.95. Um, yeah, if you go check out his video, you can go buy $45 worth of fish and hat shrimp. So uh, I highly recommend you check out his video. Him and I have been laughing about all the review videos. I mean, it's fine if you got lots of money, if you're made of money, or if you like gadgets, I get it. But uh, you you could hatch them in a boot for real. Uh, that would work. Uh, do, 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 do. Oh, Psychedelic Hippocampus, Susie. I don't know why somebody referred to you as a he and I just kept going with it in my head. I apologize. Um, I really do. But uh, love the name. Uh, let's say here. Uh, I can't find almond leaves where I am in Australia. You know, they probably grow there. Uh, if at some point, I bet some jerk came and planted them. You know, some settler. Uh, you don't need almond leaves though. Mulberry leaves, just don't put like tea tree leaves or eucalyptus. That that would be a quick way to probably, there's a weird noise, kill all your fish. I mean, those things can be soothing in small amounts, but very hard. Um, what you need is a, a, a leaf that has naturally fallen and naturally dehydrated. That's what you need. Otherwise, you're gonna get a live culture if you put a degrading leaf and you're gonna get more uh, more actual ammonia and nitrates, nitrites, and actually the tannins um, they don't get they don't uh, age the same way, they don't cure the same way, and you don't get the same out of it. Um, so you really want it to be dried of all moisture and all the um, compounds that are uh, liquid compounds and things like that. Um, Aquaballs says I am. Uh, oh, but I was gonna say you can use. Oak leaves, maple leaves, uh, almond leaves, mulberry leaves, uh, alder cones, um, choya wood, uh, bogwood, Malaysian driftwood, um, any non-aromatic wood, pretty much. If, if, if you smell the wood and it's got a pungent smell, don't use that. But anything that's been baking in the desert sun or that's been floating in the ocean for months is probably going to be okay. I, you can put it in a bucket and throw a guppy in first if you're worried about testing it, but um, most of it's good. Um, there's lists online where you can find people have tried different things, uh, but just don't put green wood in your tank. Um, I'm breeding, but water with no... Uh, wait, I'm breeding, but the water with no um, re chlorine remover has... 
Less egg hatch success than reverse osmosis walk. Okay, let me... The grammar or the spell... Uh, automatic spelling. Hello, honey. Hey. How are you, sweetie pie? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. We're going to get smoked chicken from the neighbor soon. Um, let's see. There, But what I think you're saying is that... No chlorine remover means less eggs hatch than the RO water. I'm uh, so some people say that the 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 dechlorinator with brine shrimp, anyways, helps it eat away that causticness, helps it eat away at the membrane. So maybe some eggs it can do the opposite of making them chewy and rubbery. I think it could also be that it makes fish eggs rubbery because it actually eats away and bonds the dechlorinator with the egg membrane, and then the egg tries to heal itself, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm totally guessing. And maybe that kind of makes it more of an elastic and, and pliable thing than the rigid matrix that formed it before. But I'm not sure. Yeah, Catapa leaves. You can also use two. Yep, totally. Um, chlorine dissipates when chloramine... Uh, chlor I know chlorine dissipates. Does chloramine when aged? It does. It takes longer. And there are compounds of chloramine that do not, that they have uh, put other compounds with. And so that can be tricky, but it's, it's kind of rare that you see that. I do know that St. Louis, though, has some issues with that. Um... Freedom for one and all. Thanks, Alex. I have an RO set up, just haven't used it for aquarium waters. Was about to set up a 90-gallon saltwater tank in March, but decided to postpone huge investments due to the the dreaded thing in case of job loss. Yeah, no, I totally understand. And for me, I, I get you. That's the other thing. If you guys want to join the channel, do super chats, stuff like that. Just helps me show you guys more stuff, try out more stuff get more fish to show you that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, eventually it goes towards, you know, rent. But right now it really kind of gets reinvested into the channel for the most part. So, um, and during this whole uncertain time, I get why people might want to hold on to their money rather than give it to some YouTuber uh, clown who wears his pajamas and tie-dye all day. Uh, 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 uh. T-Bone, yeah, just don't go to the shop. Go get it yourself. Get it. Um, Dr. Black would like to know what leaves you can use down under. Uh, yeah, I would like to know all of that, too. I don't. I mean, I'm sure you guys probably have oak and maple trees, right? Those are probably brought by Western Europeans at some point. I'm sure they brought mulberry. Um, I mean, you don't want to use like juniper or cedar. I don't know if you have those, but, um, or eucalyptus, but birch, you can use that. Um, poplar, you can use. I don't know about the apple and like cherry and that kind of stuff, but I'm guessing maybe. I don't know. Does anybody know that? Uh, Alex, you got to add a test link for those, or uh, an affiliate link for those test strips. Well, I do have an affiliate link in the description of a bunch of products I do use from Amazon that I feel like I can stand by and say, these are, these are good. This is the lowest price. If you want to buy it, here it is. And I have the API test kit. I like that one. The test strips, I don't really like any test strips. Uh... If I get them free from someone or like at an auction at the fish club, they come up and they're like four bucks because, you know, they're with like an old aquarium or something. I'll get them. But uh, I don't spend the $19.99 on 20 test strips or a buck a test strip. I, I don't pay that um, for something that's not even that accurate. Hugs to you, Jackson Tax. Hello. Hugs to all of you. I would hug you all and I would be typhoid Mary this this time of year in this world. Uh, be careful what you buy. I bought $30 pH TDS pen on Amazon. It worked for one day, super slow reading. So I bought a pinpoint pH meter for $90 and that is spot on pH wise. I have issues reading colors. I totally understand. 
Um, I've done the same. I bought some crappy ones. I've got one that's made by Ubuntu, which is some African company, I'm assuming, or it wants to be a Bantu-speaking company, um, the way its phonetics are. Uh, but, yeah, it's like U-B-A-N-T-E-U or something. I don't know, something like that. Uh, and I've linked one in the in the in the 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 uh, the rigmarole delumabob description below. Uh, also, if you oh to whoever was on the mobile, if you want to join as a member, there should be a link in the description also, as well as the button that says join, uh, where you sit hit subscribe. I just thought of that. But um, yeah, the pH meters, the TDS meters, all that stuff. Um, Look at the reviews, uh, especially for pH. You need to calibrate your pH meter. So if it doesn't come with reagent powder that's at like whatever it is, 6.2 and 4.8 and 9.1 or I don't, whatever it is, uh, it's, it's, it's crap, especially. Like that's how you know it's crap. Um, and they're not super, uh, yeah, if it didn't, yeah, exactly. It's the... So, uh, and you have to use them right. They have very sensitive metal uh, uh, sensor arrays. So you also need to use distilled water afterwards and just kind of clean it off, ideally. Um, catch a little father fish in the morning. Yeah, he's on every single day. If you're up on the West Coast at 5 a.m. to 7 a.m., which I usually am. And he's also uh, on the East Coast. He's on at a different time. He's on at uh, 8 till 10. So he's got two hours. He lets people come up. You can show your tanks, which is cool. Uh, I am an egomaniac, narcissist, fascist, and I do not allow that. So you guys will not be coming on my show. No, I'm just kidding. Actually, I want to get StreamYard up and running, and I'd love to do some tours of your guys' tanks or, you know, do feedback and stuff like that. Um... Psychedelic Hippocampus, I invited a uh, JW in for Bible studies about a month ago. I don't agree with a lot of their whys and wheres, f wherefores, but it did help me sort out some of my own beliefs. I was grateful. You know, I have to say something about that. I'm just going to throw it out here. I disagree on a lot of things as well with, uh, say, a Jehovah's Witness or um, Seventh-day Adventists or Mormon. Uh, I know those are all different. I'm not saying they're the same. But they, they go out, they proselytize. They've all come to my house many times. Um, and I've been as emboldened when I was younger to be an ass and open the door in my boxers, smoking a joint and drinking whiskey out of the bottle, and told them to come on in. And they have. Uh, that being said, that's where I found out that, for instance, Jehovah's Witness were pacifists. They were some of the first people to conscientiously object to war. And currently at that time, I was very against the Iraq war. I thought that it was, the evidence didn't make any sense. And it had just started like a month earlier. This is, you know, back in 03 or whatever it was. And, uh, you know, we talked and talked and talked. Uh, they didn't judge me on, I mean, yeah, they probably did, but not openly. And we had a great talk. And, you know, to me, if you stand by your values, at least I know where you stand. If you have integrity as a human being, if you don't just change with the wind, you can, it's great if you evolve and change with evidence and logic and insight and wisdom and growth. It's not good if you just change with what's surrounding you. You need that integrity. You need a moral compass. I don't care if your moral compass, I, I don't want it going south, let's just say that, but east, west, north, those are all fine. Uh, and it'll teach you something while you, uh, reset your bearings. Uh, let's see here. Alex, I lost a lot of friends because of my bipolar and depression. I, I know. I've lost a lot of friends when I quit drinking. I don't know if they were friends. I mean, some of them were. I mean, just their lives revolved around the bar being social. And that's a time in a lot of people's lives. That's a time in a lot of towns too, but where I live, there are so many things to do other than that. Um, but I now I go to bars. I just get Dr. Pepper if they have it. They don't. That's why I like the South. They have it down there. Um, but, uh, you know, that's why we can get together on here, guys. 
we can talk or we can talk about stuff that's not related to the stuff that's depressing and sometimes that's what we need sometimes we just need to power through it and and uh dwelling on it's not going to help you know sometimes it's things we can't fix the world is an imperfect place sometimes we are imperfect beings and sometimes we've tried our best and it's not good enough that it's a lie that your best is good enough it's not always and for society or the people around you but it's all you can do and um you got to know what point that is and recalibrate what is around you at that point once you've done that because after you've done all you can do if you're still not getting the support you need from your support network get a new support network there's somebody that'll have you they may be flawed but who isn't uh let's see here gotta go later Mergil. oh do 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 you harvest a 15 oh 15 pounds of lobster <laughs> Mushrooms, I'm guessing, uh, not uh, actual lobster, because I don't know. I don't know what to make of that much actual. Oh, yeah, mushrooms. There we go. Yeah, that's awesome. I was going to go chanterelle hunting uh, up in Arlington, for those of you who know the area. I often use madrona wood. Oh, okay. That's awesome. I didn't know you could use madrona wood. I had been curious about that. It is a beautiful coastal wood. It needs salt water in the air usually to grow. Uh, but it grows all over the the islands and the coastline here in Seattle. Hey, Miss Alex, your husband really does like your decorations, even though he teases you. Are you here? I have another girlfriend. Her name is Fish. She left. She's working out. She's probably going to work out. See, my wife works out, too. I am not good enough. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. She's not even seeing this. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> I will tell her hello. Thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for the good spirit. Uh, have I read any good books lately? That's a good question. Lately, I've been reading just so much uh, free literature. I mean, a few years ago, I got in the habit of reading... Um, I, I got a JSTOR account which is uh, like uh, peer-reviewed journal articles from all over the world that universities subscribe to. So when you go to university, you can get, uh, you can access all that. And usually you'd have to pay five bucks a month, 20 bucks a month, a hundred bucks a year, whatever it is to access for this topic, that topic. And you can set your search terms on a daily basis. So I've been pulling stuff up there, reading, you know, um, Gizmodo, Popular Mechanics, um, Nature, National Geographic, uh, getting lost in Wikipedia and then jumping off into the sources actually to get some context rather than just what it says. But as far as books go, you know, I feel like on uh, the Aquarium Plants book is incredible. I like that one. Um, I'm trying to think what I've got. I'm buying books and having physical books. Um, but I'm just trying to, anything that's on the shelves is probably something I figured was worth keeping. I love Michael Pollan's books. Uh, if you like plants and speaking of mushrooms and psychedelics, he actually goes into that in his newest book. I can't remember the name of it right now. Um, let's see here. Um, there was another one I read called the Emerald City about the history of Seattle from a uh, man conquering nature in the turn of the century, the Industrial Revolution kind of thing. That was pretty good. I like to read local geography and history books. Also, I mean, field guides. I have stacks and stacks of field guides. I mean, we have five more bookshelves, but um, Sunken Gardens, that's a great book about aquarium stuff. Plants for water gardens. I enjoyed that, but that's more pond stuff. Um, these guides from Dennerle, they're a little expensive. You have to order them online or from Germany, but there's one from uh, Stefan Hummel and uh, Chris Lukoff on scape, aquascaping. And there's another one uh, from 15, 16. So they're getting a, lot of, a little out of date, but um, that this one's on aquarium plants. But by far, Crystal Castleman's Aquarium Plants, that's the best book for... If you're trying to learn in a guide for what's in the hobby, 
and what we know about it it's not complete obviously but it's got over 1200 species maybe um also i've been going back and wanting to read you know some of the like fahrenheit 451 animal farm some of the like mid to early 20th century uh dystopian stuff um let's see here Oh, also, I was reading um, Christopher Moore and Chuck Palahniuk books for a while. Uh, <laughs> that's a funny book. Sex, Drugs, and Cocoa Puffs. Um, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, that's, probably, that's probably a comprehensive enough list. I always go back and read the classics, you know, like Grapes of Wrath or... Um, Catcher in the Rye. Actually, I've read that too many times. But, you know, I like to see how some of those things stand up. The other things I have that I've been looking at a lot are, you know, more mushroom guides, rock mineral and gem guides, uh, album artwork and covers. Uh, and then my wife is a deadhead. She followed the dead around and then fish for, oh, I don't know. Look at this little altar she's got right now. My ram skull, which at first she didn't like skulls at all. And now she's got, now we got skulls in the living room. Go figure. Uh, now she's got kitschy skulls all over. And I think these things. Hmm? Oh! So, yeah. Ta da! Um, yeah, we were thinking about how we were, if we were gonna decorate the tank. Hey, Jay. Hey, Cat Buddha, or Siddhartha. This is a dog my wife follows on Instagram named Bart, and she has a freaking giant picture of him. Bigger than the one of us. All right. Okay. So, I think um, in a lot of ways, bookshelves are uh, like big trucks. They're like, check out the brain on that guy, except for sometimes you just assume that people go buy used books to look smart. So just buy and keep the books that you actually use. Don't keep stuff to look smart. Keep it to pass it on. I give away a lot of books. I trade books with friends. Other than reference guides, those I keep. I keep them. I realize that Jesus is... Wait. Just realize that Jesus is the one shout-out mental illness song in... Over a year old now. Good times. Uh, don't know what that means. But I do like Jesus Christ Superstar. That's my favorite musical. And I don't like musicals usually. Doug says, I've learned a lot from you. I've got a bound volume of TFH Megs from 1964. Uh, that's tro Tropical Fish Hobbyist, guys, by the way. Um, uh, four through... When you subscribe, then uh, I think you'd get a kick out of them. Message me your address and I'll... S oh my goodness, Doug. Um, actually, you know, Doug, uh, is Doug... Sh do you... Uh, it's hard to message on uh, on YouTube. Uh, my, my email is uh, Alexander J. Williamson. Please don't send me a bunch of random penis pictures, people. Uh, or do whatever, I don't care, I'd rather, I mean, send me plants and aquarium pictures, but I've made it public, so <laughs> long story short, it's already out there in my private email, because uh, I'm a silly man who believes in the good in humanity uh, and has spam protectors, but uh, check that out uh, if if uh, Alexander J. Williamson at gmail.com, no caps, no uh, punctuation. I, if you could hit me up on there, I would really appreciate that, but that would be awesome. I'd love to share that with the channel. We could even do like a weekly, like pull out an article from the sixties or seventies and maybe read it together on the channel. I think that could be really fun. Uh, I need a dab. Welcome to the channel as a member. We've got a member who signed up today. Croiky. Oh, water flora. We got another person signing up. Come now, come all. We've got uh, buy two, get three free. That's not actually happening, but I'd like a third member just because three seems lucky. Uh, so feel free to step on up. Dan Butt says best channel ever. Well, I appreciate that, sir. Even if you don't appreciate my music and have to inject politics into it. I'm just, that's a personal joke. I'm just kidding. Uh, Dan, I love you, buddy. Hang in there. Uh, I know you know the pain 
that we all know. Uh, Alex, sorry if I missed your answer. Can you tell me how to get the most money for my fry at the local fish store? Uh, currently growing out uh, around 100 platinum rice fish fry. Um, that's a hard one with platinum rice fish right now. There's going to be a lot of rice fish on the market because everyone finished tubbing. Uh, but, Jerry, I would say stay firm on a price. I would try to sell it on Craigslist or whatever, you know. See what the price is online on online magazines and things. Then subtract half off that. They're always going to pay you a third of retail or less unless they're going out of business and or they will be because... You need a, a three times markup in the fish business for livestock. So I would say that, yeah, you should probably um, be prepared. Think of what your price you want is and then think about can they sell it for that? Would I pay that? And um, think about how much money you put into food and the original breed stock. Usually fish keeping is not a big profit. It's more of like it sustains itself and then a little rather than like pay the bills. Uh, but I would say uh, at your local store, if they don't have any platinum rice fish, if you can tell them you've sold some locally and that you've got X amount of dollars, that always helps. Venmo lets you keep a record of that money and you can say, well, you just say that it was for this fish and then you've got a receipt right there showing that you've done it. Um, I've used that trick before. But really, it's, it just comes down to having a consistent supply of quality fish uh, and establishing that you're going to go there and buy things or that you're willing to take less but for store credit. I mean, that's the bottom line that they're going to try to pull on you pretty much everywhere. Um, but there's not really a, an easy... I do have uh, breeding for profit. And honestly, Aquarium Co-op has some great videos on breeding for profit too that might help you out. He's got a whole series on that from about four years ago. Actually, from eight years ago, he has a, a series that was really good and honest. And then he kind of modified it, I think, because maybe people were using some of his advice was too good. And uh, so he redid it kind of in his new studio and everything. Um, let's see here. Whatever you do, do not use black walnut wood. It's a chemical warfare. Uh, oh, wow. It's chemical warfare is detrimental. Thank you, Chevy Fish. I appreciate that. David, we got another lurker. Thank you. Welcome to the lurker show. All right. Uh, there we go. I'm nine minutes behind. All right, David. Uh, you're probably already gone, but have a good one. Um, oh, wow. I used to turn wall black walnut bowls. Didn't wear my respirator once. Sick for two weeks. Big mistake. Wow, that is crazy. I didn't realize black walnut was like that. Uh, I've never woodworked with walnut. I'm too cheap. I always have like soft pine or if I'm doing something hard, I skip from wood all the way to jade or pipe stone uh, and use a Dremel. Um, let's see here. I just started fishing. Anyone here do that? I catch and release. I fish. Yeah, a lot of us on FishTube fish for sure. Um... Let's see here. Look at the big brain on Brad. <laughs> I like that one. Um, all right, let's see here. Oh, okay. Uh, Chevy Fish says, Android mobile users click the icon arrow slash dollar sign where you type chat messages. It should show you. Is that show you where to join or show you the membership stuff? I, I don't know. Or a super chat. My, I, I'm not sure. But I know whatever Chevy's saying, she's smarter than me on this one. So that's a thing. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Psychedelic Hippocampus, where do you live, by the way? I'm just curious of that because you say missiles. Do you mean projectiles, like throwing them at each other? Walnuts, we don't say missiles here. And so I'm curious that that's a trans a lost in translation we're getting. Jamie Lee, hello. Gotta go uh, buy a bottle brush, remove hair algae from the plants. Yeah, or a stiff toothbrush too. Um, but good luck to you. Take care, novice. Uh, 
novice. I mean, you're gonna have to change your name at some point. Um, thanks, Alex. My phone didn't do a good job of hearing me, and the spelling was wacky. No problem. I try my best. I know. I'm not one of those people who's like, send it again when you know how to spell. Like, I know that we have, all of us have big derpy thumbs for our little phones and whatever, and uh, auto check and auto correct and speak to talk. The robots are not about to take over. That's all I have to say. They're about to teak over. Maybe they'll put teak uh, veneer on everything. That's probably what would happen. Robots are like, ready to teak over. And they'll deforest all the teak, which has already been deforested. And, and that will be the, the, the T-1000 uh, event, the, the Skynet event. They will teak over. Um, let's see here. Do, do, do. We used to throw them at each other a lot. Poor choice of words. There we go. Figured it out. Uh, yeah, um, Alex. Black walnuts use biological warfare. No plants grow near them, but often symbiotic relationship with fungi add to their repertoire. That is really cool. Um, yeah, you know, that is uh, the allopathy and chemopathy of plants is something I really would love to know more about. It's a very new field to know, like, I mean, for them to have good peer-reviewed info on. But I know they've known cedar and juniper also, those the aromatic, whatever it is, that, you know, you smell chip cedar and spruce, things like that. That keeps most fungi, a lot of pests away, like hardcore. And, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of trees that have that. Um, sassafras uh, trees uh, um, or saffron oil comes out of the maripan tree in Southeast Asia. That's where we get ecstasy. That's where we make MDMA out of and MDMA, MDMA and MDA and actually sassafras, which is in sarsaparilla. Um, it, it has a, it's a precursor chemical. So it's just kind of crazy. It's using something that does oxytocin and our dopamine and serotonin, which make us love make us panic make us communicate with our gut biome so there's something going on in these them their trees uh jerry says i come for the information i stay for the tangents well i'm glad that is uh fun for you uh my wife is just tired of it <laughs> ayahuasca there's another tree that's got a hell of a punch actually a lot of plants have dmt in them uh, if you're interested in dmt if you don't know what i'm talking about you probably don't care ayahuasca um uh i can also recommend african dream root uh i don't remember its latin name but uh every plant pretty much has dmt in it in trace amounts some have a lot more than others um Let's see here. Uh, and if you don't know what DMT is, Google it. There's a documentary called The Spirit Molecule that gets really woo-woo, but uh, it kind of goes into, you'll get the idea. Uh, dude, I watched the sickest documentary called DMT, The Love Drug. So good. Uh, yeah, um, I think oxytocin is the bonding and love drug along with serotonin, but I agree that it can do that. Oh, that was it, The Spirit Molecule. Uh, I feel you. I feel you. Yeah. Um, I think Joe Rogan's another person who's kind of um, professed that. I have to say, as someone who encountered psychedelics early on, uh, probably too early, definitely too early for what I would ever recommend most people, uh, I ended up how I ended up, and I'm whatever. I like my life, so okay. I guess it worked out, but... Um, it demystified the world in some ways and it dumbfounded me in others in the sense that uh, I had senses crossover. I saw things um, behaving in ways and thought of things that were so abstract that I'd never really thought of them that way before. And um, I would say that I realized that things like my near death experiences that I would come to encounter later, the lightning strike, um, Times when I'm so scared, you get that adrenaline rush and you just kind of time goes into slow-mo. Uh, time I got stabbed, the time I got shot at. I didn't do anything to get shot at. I, the stabbing was when I was young and dumb and stupid and 
I don't know, it just happened. But uh, the the shooting was just something that happened downtown while I've had this channel while I was working. And it was like that. Time slowed as I saw someone pull out a gun and start shooting at someone. And uh, I was in, in the crossfire with about 20 other um, civilians in the city. And uh, yeah, it slowed down. And I would have thought that that was something out, outer out of this world, um, I, I would have misattributed a supernatural or religious experience to that if I hadn't have experienced the same thing chemically induced. Now, does that make it any less powerful? I don't think so. Uh, I think that humans can only feel what they can feel. And whether that's God and it's in a real God out there that's impacting us, or whether that's a God in our heads that causes us to feel joy and in these ways um or whether that's a chemical uh then i think those are all valid experiences i do think if you're inducing it with a chemical you will usually become resistant to it or you may um in many traditions that have worked with psychedelics they believe that that is a false entry into that place and that you should have to work for those moments because they are so rare and fleeting in life and that's what keeps life special. Um, and that's why you don't want those, um, whatever, uh, cheap thrills. Uh, <laughs> uh, water flora, you crack me up. Okay, let's see here. I don't know how I got off on the hallucinogen tangent either, but... Uh, yeah, after I got my brain hit with lightning, I think I'm done with them. But I, they they had some purpose in my life, I will say. And I think they could have some major purposes for depression and things. I had cluster headaches. This is the last thing I'm going to say about them. Uh, and I'm not saying, I'm not a doctor. I'm not giving any advice. I'm definitely not a lawyer or telling you to go do anything. Don't. But um, I had cluster headaches and psilocybin. Uh, Baocystin and psilocin. I had a massive dose of azorescence, it's a type of mushroom, uh, in college. And I it was so bad I was going to drop out one uh, quarter from tension headaches in my neck, but cluster headaches. I'd, I'd get this aura and my vision would go white and fuzzy and it felt like there were hot nails being driven into my eyes and into random, like three or four spots in my head at a time. And I'd throw up and I just felt, it was just awful. And I had them for two or three years and they were getting really frequent uh, and would get triggered by anxiety um, and things like that, stress. I did those in a dose and I freaked out. I had the worst experience of my life, uh, chemically speaking, I would say, like just freaked out, you know, lost motor skills and it was like a living nightmare. But after that, I've never had another cluster headache in 15 years so and and a study has come out saying that they are um effective at stopping cluster headaches as well as coming to terms with death um chevy fish i was shot while walking to work from the bus when i was 18 the guy shot three people that day who looked like his girlfriend he just split from oh my god I had no idea, Chevy Fish. I'm sorry, that is very crazy. I'm I'm very glad you're still with us as well. Like it's me said. Wow. Well, yeah, I'm so glad you're here. See, we all have crazy stories. Um, everyone has a crazy story, and uh, take some time to get to know each other. I know this this stream's long, running really long. I'm having a lot of fun. I've been streaming a lot lately. The algorithm hates that, but I don't really care. Um, and I appreciate your support, you guys, both uh, emotionally, mentally, physically. Not physically. You guys aren't here physically. Well, some of you are. Jason is. I see Jason. Uh, I see people like Bentley and stuff. Uh, so some of you physically. Uh, but, yes, I hope you guys all hang in there. Um, and uh, my memory with names is terrible. What was it? Doug something who had the awesome magazine offer. Man, that was cool. Okay, I'll, I can go back and watch this tomorrow if I have to hunt for it and figure out a way to get a hold of him. But email me if you want, Doug. 
Um, all right, you guys. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's been a real treat. Uh, I will probably have a video midweek. I'm thinking about doing a video on how to switch out um, substrate, at, like a substrate that puts out ammonia. It's something a lot of people have asked me about, and there's a few methods for doing it, so I think I might make a video on that. Doug Sharp, thank you so much, buddy. I really appreciate it. And I know that's a jerk move to be like, you're like, hey, just shoot me an email. And I'm like, no, you talk to me. You talk to my people. Um, you guys, uh, thanks for making it a great stream tonight. Uh, and, uh, you know, take care of yourselves. But uh, obviously take care of your critters, your plants. Take care of, of your heart, your soul. I know a lot of us are getting tired of this whole lockdown or or whatever it means for you where you're at. I mean, some people are under different stresses than others, but um, you know, you're not alone. You got a community here. Um, you probably have other communities you don't realize you have, and uh, don't be afraid to reach out, specifically to those of us who have said we're here for you tonight, but really to the community at large. Nobody's gonna judge you if they do, if they say some uh, untour uh, things to you in any of my forums they're going to be gone. Um, but I've never had to do that. And I think that there's something incredible about just the energy, positivity, and the mindset of people who want to educate themselves. They want to better themselves. And we're all here learning together uh, in this hobby that you can never stop learning from. So keep up on the water changes. Uh, keep up on taking care of each other. Be safe out there. People are crazy sometimes. But remember, sometimes those quote-unquote crazy people, they need help. They need someone to love uh, them. They need something nice done for them. And so, uh, you know, that's another thing to remember. Just don't put yourself in danger. But, uh, of course, like I said, take care of all your critters. Take care of your people. Your people are very important, whoever they may be, family or friends, and uh, each other online. And uh, other than that, like I said, take care of yourself or you can't do any of the other stuff. If we all do that half the time, I think our world will be twice as good. And uh, as always, take care. Have a wonderful night. I see you, Aquarium Cop. I love you, buddy. I had a great talk the other evening. Speaking of people going through hell right now, uh, I was saying a prayer for you on the beat. I know it's rough right now in NYC. I read some more on what you were talking about. It's crazy. Um, and, uh, I will, uh, I will talk to you guys later. This was a long stream, but I, it went quick in, in my mind. I had a lot of fun. We've had hundreds of people in here and, uh, that makes me really happy that clearly some people were enjoying it. So Zen Ginger, Waterflora, I got, I can't name you all, but I love you guys. I really do. And I mean that in a brotherly universal human love sense. So, uh, let's stop with the mushiness. Go do your water changes. Uh, and have a wonderful night, you guys. Take care. I'll talk to you on uh, Saturday. Uh, the next live stream will probably be around 4 or 5 p.m. And uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, I might hop on for another stream some other time. And I'll probably be at Father Fish's chat in the morning or, you know, here and there in other chats. So I'll probably see some of you around. Talk to you guys later. Have a great night. Stay safe. Bye.